Come on. Victor Telegio was from Miami. He was Maya Lansky's right-hand man. When his prior reputation as an enforcer from 20 years ago was known to never bury a body because he felt it sent a stronger message to leave it in the street. <laughs> this is the guy we now have to deal with. I'm sure you don't want to go into the ocean bar. It's really, it's beautiful in there. I think I'm right. happy I don't have to go there. I like it here. There's an exit. I'm like a ghost. Nobody knows I'm here. But tell them I speak for our friends in Florida. We're very excited. It's been our lifelong dream to build casino resorts on the East Coast. As the Prohibition era drew to a close, marking the end of its tumultuous 14-year history, characterized by corruption and the rise of organized crime, figures like Luciano, Lansky, Costello, and Dutch Schultz had already begun diversifying their operations. Despite the end of Prohibition not being a celebratory moment for them, they strategically pivoted to other lucrative areas, such as gambling, looking to exert their influence on both police and political realms to legitimize their activities. The shift in focus was not just limited to local operations. The Caribbean beckoned as a promising frontier. Luciano outlined the vision, We have to expand someplace, and we need a place to send our dough where it'll keep making money and get them guys from Washington off our backs. Meyer's been down to Havana, and he has made some good contacts. Within a couple of months, by August or September, he is going back again, and he will make a deal. It could cost us a bundle in front, so everybody better gets ready to put up at least half a million each. The substantial investment demanded did not sit well with everyone, sparking anger among the Union Siciliano members, reflective of the massive earnings at stake. Despite the initial backlash, Luciano's persuasive abilities and leadership proved effective as he reassured his crew about the benefits of the investment, particularly emphasizing the tax-free nature of the income. His plans for Havana were ambitious and involved significant payouts to local officials, including a hefty sum to Batista to secure their operations. Maya Lansky, Frank Costello and Charlie Luciano's foresight extended to potential expansions across the Caribbean and even into Europe, foreseeing a need to collaborate with or confront other international crime groups. As they extended their reach into the trucking industry, leveraging the infrastructure initially built during the bootlegging era, Luciano and his associates were poised to exploit the economic surge brought by World War II. Their involvement in the trucking industry became a cornerstone of their influence, enabling them to exert control over essential industries like dairy and fresh foods. Luciano boasted, During Prohibition, we ran the biggest trucking operation in the United States. We knew more about trucks and tight schedules than any company in the country. Meyer Lansky's strategic finesse was evident as he orchestrated minimal yet effective pressures on the fresh food industries, leading to significant returns from insignificant transactions, like adding half a cent per loaf of bread. This strategy ensured a continuous cash flow, reinforcing their stronghold over essential goods consumed by Americans daily. However, Luciano lamented the limitations of his contemporaries' vision, particularly their inability to foresee and seize broader opportunities that could have propelled them into even greater wealth. He saw potential in other markets and industries that his peers were reluctant to explore, believing that had they embraced his broader vision, they could have established a financial empire far exceeding their already substantial illicit gains. Through strategic manipulation of both illicit and legitimate business ventures, Luciano and his Mafia counterparts not only survived the end of Prohibition, but also laid the groundwork for a more diversified and enduring criminal empire. This adaptability and foresight underscored their enduring influence in the annals of organized crime. Charlie Luciano always remembered the pivotal aid he received from Lansky and his cohort of Jewish allies. Following the downfall of Maranzano, these men were promptly accorded a place of honor at the criminal underworld's high table. 
With their support, the ambitious duo of Siegel and Lansky soared to new heights. Maya Lansky crafted a colossal gambling kingdom across Cuba and the Bahamas, gaining fame as the rumored chairman of the board of the National Crime Syndicate. Meanwhile, Bugsy Siegel earned his stripes as the visionary who started to make moves in California, thereby ushering the era of organized crime into Los Angeles and eventually the Las Vegas desert. Labor racketeering found its master in Louis Lepke Buchalter, one of the most fearsome figures in the chronicles of American crime. Lepke orchestrated an immense racketeering and smuggling operation, famously employing hitmen as casually as a builder might hire laborers. Unlike the typical gangster facade, Buchalter presented a stark contrast. Quiet, understated, and apologetically neat, he preferred the shadows, allowing his underlings the limelight if the profits flowed his way. Masquerading as a successful businessman, he epitomized the most lethal breed of criminal, adept at dodging the law for years. Born in 1897 on the gritty streets of New York's Lower East Side, Louis Buchalter was the progeny of Barnett Buchalter, a Russian immigrant, and Rose Buchalter. Amidst a sprawling family of eleven from various marriages, one of Lepka's brothers ascended to the rank of rabbi, another to a dentist, while a sister embraced the calling of a teacher. Lepka himself, endearingly nicknamed Lepkele by his mother, a tender Yiddish term meaning Little Louis, ventured down a far grimmer path. Lucky Luciano's first encounter with Buchalter was marked by an immediate visceral assessment. The moment I laid eyes on him, all muscle and menace, I knew here was a man more brawn than brains. Yet, when I attempted to address him informally, he interjected softly. You can call me Lepke, Luciano recounted. Despite the initial awkwardness, which elicited laughter from Luciano at the nickname's quaint origin, a bond formed, rooted in the unassuming gangster's sentimental attachment to his mother's pet name. J. Edgar Hoover, however, harboured no such fondness. In the thirties, he branded Lepke one of the most dangerous criminals in the United States. Despite a disciplined childhood and better-than-average academic performance, the death of his father at fourteen propelled young Buchalter from school corridors to the harsh realities of the workforce setting him on a notorious path that diverged sharply from his siblings' respectable careers. By the time Lepke was eighteen, his family had all relocated out west, leaving him the lone holdout. Despite an offer from an elder brother to finance his high school and college education, Lepke chose a different path, settling into a furnished room on the east side. It was in this tumultuous neighbourhood that Louis Buchalter began his criminal pursuits, aligning himself with a gang of street toughs, engaged in mugging intoxicated individuals, pickpocketing and pilfering from pushcarts. During this formative period, Lepke's chief companion was Jacob Gura Shapiro, a robust, brash and guttural enforcer who weighed in at 200 pounds and was once dubbed by a reporter as the Donald Duck of the New York underworld, perpetually irate. Shortly after his 19th birthday, Lepke's burgeoning criminal career led to his first jail stint for stealing a salesman's sample case. Released on parole in 1917, he found himself incarcerated again the following year on a larceny charge, and by 1920 he was serving time for burglary. Released after two years, Lepke shifted his focus to labour racketeering, a field he dominated without further prison interruptions until his 1939 arrest. Outside his domestic life as a devoted family man who seldom indulged in alcohol or gambling, Lepke commanded an army of gangsters, extorting millions from his victims. His annual protection revenue was estimated to exceed $10 million. His gang wielded a terrifying arsenal of destructive acids, bludgeons, blackjacks, knives, fire, ice picks, and firearms. Lepke's approach to labor disputes involved brutal intimidation tactics against workers and manipulation of union activities by installing his agents or establishing rival unions. His philosophy was simple. Control both the union and the employer's association 
keeping both in his pocket. This strategy cemented his legendary status, and those who defied his orders or approached the police faced severe repercussions, including acid attacks, disfigurement, and even murder. As one associate chillingly remarked, Lep loves to hurt people. Leveraging the same tactics of terror, Buchalter infiltrated legitimate businesses, opponents experienced destruction of property or sabotage of their stock by Lepka's specialized task force skilled in acid attacks. Upon capitulation, Lepka would embed his men within the factory, positioning them as managers, foremen, and bookkeepers. By 1932, Buchalter had his grip on a diverse array of industries and unions throughout New York, from bakery and pastry drivers to milliners, garment workers, shoe tradespeople, poultry markets, taxi services, motion picture operators, and fur truckers. In a perilous expansion of his criminal empire, Lepke also ventured into drug trafficking, becoming a major importer and distributor of heroin, cocaine and opium in the United States. Utilizing charming and personable young women as couriers, each was paid $2,000 plus expenses to transport narcotics-filled trunks from locations across Europe back to key American ports, including New York, San Francisco and Seattle. With this lucrative trade, Lepke amassed a fortune, living the life of a multi-millionaire. Living in a luxurious apartment in mid-Manhattan, Louis Lepke Buchalter led a life of opulence, complete with chauffeur-driven cars for his frequent trips to racetracks and nightclubs. He often spent winters basking in the sun of Florida and California. Despite his composed exterior, Lepke was a figure of intense fear within his ranks. His own men, wary of his calm yet formidable presence, dubbed him the Judge, or sometimes Judge Louis. Shalom Bernstein, one of his associates, captured the essence of Lepke's authority by saying, I don't ask questions, I just obey. It would be healthier. The story of Louis Lepke Buchalter weaves a dramatic and complex tapestry in the annals of American organized crime. Lepke's downfall is notable not just for his notorious criminal activities, but also for the controversial circumstances surrounding his capture and eventual execution. Lepke became one of the few mob leaders who would face the ultimate punishment, execution by electric chair, a fate engineered by some of the most prominent figures within the mob itself, alongside notable law enforcement officials. The events leading to his demise began to unfold when Albert Anastasia, Frank Costello, Charlie Luciano and Maya Lansky decided to distance themselves from Lepke due to the increasing heat from law enforcement agencies. Walter Winchell, a famous journalist known for his connections both within Hollywood and the criminal underworld, played an unusual role in these events. He acted as an intermediary in the negotiations that led to Lepke's surrender to J. Edgar Hoover, the then director of the FBI. Frank Costello was instrumental in brokering this deal, which was designed to minimize Lepka's time in prison. However, the reality was starkly different from what had been promised to Lepka. Upon surrendering, Lepka was led to believe that he would face only certain charges, and that after a brief stint in prison, he would be released. Instead, J. Edgar Hoover personally informed him that he would die in prison. This stark declaration was a prelude to the harsher reality that awaited him. Lepke was subsequently handed over to Thomas Dewey, a prosecutor with a strong track record of tackling organized crime, who put him on trial. This trial would eventually lead to Lepke's conviction for murder, the charge that led to his sentencing to death by electric chair. While imprisoned, Lepke allegedly became an informant, providing information about the operations and members of the mob. However, the intelligence he provided during this time did not lead to significant prosecutions against his former associates, such as Costello, Luciano, or Lansky. The evidence gathered, while extensive, was not directly used against these top mob figures. Instead, these leaders maintained their freedom through extreme measures, 
as hinted by rumours of others being eliminated through violence or under suspicious circumstances to prevent any testimony that could incriminate them. Lepka's execution marks a grim chapter in mob history, illustrating the brutal extents to which the mob's top echelons would go to protect their interests. His story serves as a stark reminder of the lethal stakes in the highest levels of organised crime and the often blurry line between the criminals and the law enforcers in early 20th century America. The history of organised crime in America is rich with tales that straddle the line between fact and fiction, often amplified by the dramatic portrayals in Hollywood and the pages of crime novels. One of the more fascinating aspects of this history involves the collaboration between Jewish and Italian mobsters in New York during the 30s. Initially dismissed by many as mere legend, this alliance was eventually confirmed to have existed and its implications were significant. The collaboration led to the formation of what was known as the National Crime Syndicate, a sophisticated and efficient network designed to coordinate and control criminal activities across the United States. This syndicate was a revolutionary development in the world of organized crime. It was established as a response to the rampant gang wars of the Prohibition era, which proved to be bad for business. Key figures, such as Maya Lansky, Charlie Luciano and others, saw the benefit of a unified approach to managing the criminal underworld. By forming the National Crime Syndicate, these mobsters effectively created a board of directors for organised crime, which included representatives from both Italian-American and Jewish-American mobs along with other ethnic groups. The syndicate's operations were far-reaching, involving everything from illicit gambling and loan sharking to narcotics trafficking and labour racketeering. They set up a system for resolving disputes between gangs through an enforcement arm known as Murder Incorporated, which was responsible for enforcing the syndicate's decisions and carrying out contract killings. Robert F. Kennedy, during his time as Attorney General in the 60s, played a crucial role in exposing the extent of organised crime in America, including the activities of the National Crime Syndicate. His efforts to combat organised crime were unprecedented, involving extensive investigations, high-profile arrests and legislative actions aimed at dismantling the Mafia and other criminal organisations. Kennedy's acknowledgement of the Syndicate's existence helped validate the stories of informants and investigators who had long argued that such a coalition had been influencing much of the nation's criminal activities. Thus, what might have once been considered a myth was indeed a reality, illustrating the complex, shadowy interconnections that have defined America's criminal history. This acknowledgement by Kennedy not only underscored the seriousness of organized crime's impact on society, but also highlighted the challenge faced by law enforcement in tackling such a well-organized, deeply entrenched adversary. The founders included notable figures such as Lepke, Bugsy Siegel, Maya Lansky, Dutch Schultz, Longy Zwilman, Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello and Joe Adonis, Johnny Torrio, Jake Guzik and Al Capone, Santo Traficante Sr., Silver Dollar Sam and the Long Family, Mo Dalitz in Cleveland, The Purple Gang, Oni Madden and a whole lot more. At Lepke's, Albert's, Dutch and others' instigation, this syndicate formed an enforcement wing composed of cold-blooded killers to ensure compliance and order. This notorious group, primarily made up of a Brooklyn-based gang of Jewish criminals, led by Abe Kid Twist Reles, the famous snitch who would be thrown out of a window by crooked police officers, and it would be arranged by a crooked commissioner, and complemented by an Italian faction led by Harry Happy Maioni, was infamously christened Murder Incorporated by crime reporter Harry Feeney. The Jewish gang members frequented a shabby candy store known as Midnight Roses, situated beneath the elevated subway tracks at the corner of Saratoga and Livonia Avenue in Brooklyn's Brownsville area. Open around the clock by a woman named Rose, this location allegedly served as the planning ground for numerous murders, becoming a grim landmark in the city's underworld. 
Conversations within its walls oscillated between the daily defeats of the Brooklyn Dodgers and the intricacies of murder. While the romanticized versions of gangster life fill the pages of crime lore, documented history confirms that Italian and Jewish mobsters indeed collaborated and sometimes clashed throughout the 20s and 30s. These alliances facilitated meetings among crime leaders across various states and contract killings were not uncommon. During his time evading the aggressive pursuit of New York's special prosecutor, Thomas E. Dewey, Lepka utilized Abe Relis and his associates to silence those he feared could betray him. It is estimated that between 60 to 80 individuals were executed under Lepka's command, victims of burning, burial in quicklime, shootings, stabbings, or strangulation. Lepka is even credited with popularizing the term hit as a euphemism for contract killing. Though not a direct protege of Arnold Rothstein, Louis Pretty Amberg emerged as a significant underworld figure from the late 20s until his violent demise in 1935. Known as one of the city's most notorious killers, Amberg was reputed to have eliminated anywhere from 18 to 100 men, although the exact number remains uncertain. Despite numerous arrests, his cunning and luck always kept him just out of reach of conviction for his alleged crimes. Louis Pretty Amberg was notorious for his chilling method of execution, which involved trapping his live victims in a laundry bag, strategically tied around their arms, legs and neck. This grim setup caused victims to strangle themselves as they desperately fought to escape. This macabre technique was so infamous that Damon Runyon immortalized it in several stories, casting Amberg as a thinly veiled character in his gritty tales. Nicknamed Pretty due to his strikingly harsh features, Amberg was once approached by the Ringling Brothers Circus with an offer to appear as the missing link, a proposition he found amusing rather than offensive, often boasting about it with a perverse sense of pride. Born in Russia in 1898, Louis immigrated to the United States with his family, settling in the rough-and-tumble neighborhood of Brownsville, Brooklyn. There, his father peddled fruit, a trade Louis took up at the tender age of ten, with a uniquely aggressive sales tactic. He would kick at people's doors, and upon being opened, he would thrust the fruits forward with a gruff command, Buy. His daunting presence ensured quick sales. By his twenties, Pretty Amberg had become the feared enforcer of Brownsville. Alongside his older brother Joe, he ran a ruthless loan sharking operation, imposing a steep interest rate of 20% a week. Borrowers were starkly warned that failure to pay on time would result in their death, a policy that ensured prompt payments. During Prohibition, Pretty and his brothers, including Jaime the Rat, who later met a grim end in jail, dominated the local bootlegging scene, ruthlessly bombing any speakeasy that dared refuse their alcohol. The Prohibition era turned Amberg extraordinarily wealthy. He flaunted his newfound riches in New York's night spots, where waiters vied to serve his table due to his habit of leaving lavish $100 tips. Pretty later diversified his criminal portfolio to include laundry services, offering local businessmen a deal they could not refuse under the threat of violent consequences. A dark joke circulated that Amberg ventured into the laundry business to keep a steady supply of bags for his human stiffs. Amidst the tumult of the New York crime scene, Louis Pretty Amberg fiercely protected his territory from encroaching rivals. When Dutch Schultz brazenly proposed a partnership, Amberg's chilling response was a stark reflection of his ruthless nature. Arthur, why don't you put a gun in your mouth and see how many times you can pull the trigger? Undeterred, Schultz tried to infringe upon Amberg's domain by opening a new loan office nearby. However, his intrusion was swiftly met with lethal force. Within 24 hours, Schultz's men were found dead, their bodies riddled with bullets. Amberg's ruthlessness extended even to his allies, such as Legs Diamond, whom he starkly warned against entering Brownsville, threatening his life and that of his family. It would be in the summer of 1929 
Under the golden glow of a setting sun, the bustling boardwalk of Atlantic City set the stage for a convergence of America's most formidable mobsters. At the heart of this historic gathering was none other than Al Capone, accompanied by a cadre of influential partners, including the likes of Frank Erickson, Phil Castle, and the formidable Costello. Together, they forged an alliance with the Annenberg family and the media empire of Randolph Hearst, rooted deep in the windy streets of Chicago. Their grand scheme? To establish one of the most lucrative national racing wires and gambling networks across the nation. This ambitious endeavour was orchestrated through the strategic collaboration of Capone, the prowess of Jake Guzik, and the robust muscle of the Annenberg family. As the Atlantic waves crashed nearby, Lucky Luciano mused about the gathering's broader implications. We're not just talking about liquor here, he declared, foreseeing the impending end of prohibition and the legalization of alcohol. Gambling's on the table too. Yet, despite the lucrative opportunities, territorial disputes among the bosses simmered beneath the surface, momentarily stalling their progress. Amidst the whiskey fueled discussions and the clinking of glasses, a pivotal encounter unfolded on the crowded boardwalk. Al Capone, the very embodiment of Chicago's rugged charm, met face to face with Moses Annenberg. Annenberg, a titan in his own right, wielded control over the mob enforcing the distribution of William Randolph Hearst's newspapers across Chicago, a city where securing a prime corner was a battle of both wits and brawn. It was this chance meeting that sparked the crucial conversation about integrating the nation's racing wire service with the daily racing form. Here, on the vibrant Atlantic City boardwalk, the framework of an expansive betting network was laid, a system that would eventually stretch across the entire United States. Frank Erickson was promptly summoned to meticulously craft the operational details of what would become a cornerstone of the Annenberg family's fortune. Born from the muscle of Chicago and the strategic alliances formed in Atlantic City, this network was not just about laying off bets. It was about securing an empire. The National Convention, initially convened to strategize the bootlegging business, dramatically shifted its focus to dominate the burgeoning field of organized gambling. Recognizing the potential of a connected telephone wire system, they envisioned a future where they could control the flow of gambling information as easily as they had liquor. This system proved pivotal for relaying instant results and information on horse races, dog races, and other betting affairs. By the 30s and 40s, with New York and Chicago blazing the trail, the gambling industry witnessed the rise of new players like Tony Accardo and Carlos Marcello, who would each take a hand in steering the future of their respective cities' gambling circuits. The establishment of these communication channels marked the dawn of a new era. As prohibition faded into history, these mobsters, now captains of an industry worth billions, ventured into other realms of influence, including entertainment, trucking, and construction. Their empire, built on the foundations laid in Atlantic City, allowed them an unprecedented scope of operation and influence, forever altering the landscape of American organized crime. Meanwhile, near to the frenzied underworld of New York, in Newark, New Jersey, another formidable figure reigned, Abner Longy Zwillman. Towering over six feet two inches, Zwillman earned the nickname Longy from his childhood moniker De Lange, the Yiddish term for the tall one. Considered alongside Maya Lansky as one of the most influential Jewish mob bosses in America, Zulman, with his Italian associates Richie Boyardo and Willie Moretti, controlled Newark from the Prohibition era well into the 50s. His dominance in organized crime was so pronounced that he was dubbed the Al Capone of New Jersey. Zwillman's notoriety was confirmed during his testimony before the Kefauver Committee in 1950 tasked with investigating organized crime. Senator Charles Toby inquired if it was true that he had been known as the Al Capone of New Jersey, to which Zwillman responded with a mixture of dismissal and humor. 
That is a myth that has been developing, Mr. Senator, for many years, and during the time when I should have had sense enough to stop it or get up and get out of the state, I did not have sense enough. And until the point where it blossomed and bloomed, I am not that. I don't intend to be. I never strive to be. And I am trying to make a living for my family and myself. He humorously added, But those rumours go around. They accuse me of owning places. I walk into a restaurant, and I own the restaurant. I walked into a hotel, and I own the hotel. I take a shine twice, and I own the boot black too. Senator Toby wryly noted, Those are the penalties of greatness. Born in Newark in 1904 to immigrant parents from Russia, Zvilman was the third of seven children, carving out his own notorious path through America's landscape of organized crime. Abraham Zvilman, Longi's father, eked out a modest existence peddling live chickens from a stall in the public market on Prince Street, barely scraping by. This challenging upbringing deeply impacted Longi, who vividly recalled his early years of constant hunger. When once asked why he was so driven to amass wealth, he simply said, All I remember is that as kids, my brothers, sisters and I were always hungry. Tragedy struck when Longi was just fourteen. His father passed away, compelling him to leave school and join the workforce. He started by renting a horse and wagon to peddle fruits and vegetables, but it was not long before he realised that the real money in his neighbourhood was in the hands of either politicians or gamblers not peddlers. The onset of prohibition presented the perfect opportunity for him to chase the wealth, respect and power he craved. Capitalising on the era, Longy quickly made a name for himself in the underworld by hijacking liquor shipments, taking over still operations and engaging in rum running. He was not alone in these endeavours. He was backed by his childhood friend Joseph Dock Stacher and their group, the Third Ward Longy Mob. As his ambitions grew, so did his operations. Longy formed a crucial alliance with Joseph Reinfeld, a savvy saloon owner who had mastered the logistics of smuggling whiskey directly from the Canadian Bronfman Brothers Distillery in Montreal to the shores of New Jersey. Abe Zwillman's combination of intellect and ruthlessness ensured that no hijacker dared target him. Quickly proving his worth, Zwillman ascended to become a full partner in the bootlegging operation led by himself and Joseph Reinfeld. Together, they ran one of the largest and most lucrative illegal alcohol ventures in the United States during Prohibition, responsible for importing 40% of all the illicit alcohol consumed across the country. The operation was highly organised, with a sales office based in Newark. Customers would deposit money at the office, receive a receipt for a specified amount of whiskey, and then proceed to collect their cargo directly from a ship anchored offshore. On particularly stormy nights, such as one notable evening in 1928 off the New Jersey coast, the crew would use a specially designed hose to pump whiskey from copper-lined tanks on their ship to oaken vats hidden in shore-based houses. From these houses, customers would then collect their whiskey. Treasury agents estimated that from 1926 to 1933, Zwillman amassed over $40 million from his bootlegging activities alone. After Prohibition ended, he diversified his criminal portfolio to include the numbers racket, bookmaking, slot machines, cigarette vending, and gambling operations. Moreover, Zwillman extended his influence into labor organizations, installing associates as leaders of various local unions across New Jersey, such as the Wine and Liquor Salesmen, the International Union of Operating Engineers, the Retail Clerks Union, the Teamsters, and the Motion Picture Machine Operators Union. In 1942, a Newark businessman sent a confidential letter to J. Edgar Hoover, expressing his frustration with Zwillman's tight grip on local industries. The letter detailed how Zwillman, from his office at the Public Service Tobacco Council in Hillside, NJ, was so powerful that respected business people were forced to beg him for permission to operate without interference. The businessman accused Zwillman of maintaining his network's privilege and safety by intimidating high officers at military camps 
and draft boards to secure deferments for his associates. Zwilman's relationships were not limited to local figures. He also had deep ties with major organized crime leaders across New Jersey and New York, including Angelo, Gip, DiCarlo, Gerardo Catina, the Moretti brothers, Maya Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Lepke Buchalter, Frank Costello, and Lucky Luciano. His bond with Siegel was particularly strong. Whenever Zwilman visited Los Angeles, Siegel was invariably the first person he met, often staying at Siegel's residence. Zwilman once commented that he would have done any favor for Siegel, no matter the nature of the request. As Zwilman's wealth grew, so did his political influence. He refined bribery into an art form, ensuring his illegal operations were protected by a network of bought-off police officers, prosecutors, and judges. Police escorts for liquor trucks, misplaced legal evidence, bungled indictments, and even courtroom negotiations for bribes were all part of the corrupt landscape that allowed Zwilman to operate with relative impunity and secure his status as a formidable force in the underworld. Because of the rampant corruption among police, prosecutors and courts, Newark was transformed into the illegal capital of the country during Prohibition. Even after Prohibition's end, Abner Longji Zwilman's political influence persisted strongly. In Essex County, New Jersey, the Democratic leader routinely sought Longi's approval for the list of Democratic candidates. Anyone he vetoed would not be nominated. Well into the 40s, Newark's governance, including the mayor and three of the city's five commissioners, were deeply indebted to Longy for their positions. The mayor at the time, former dentist Meyer Ellenstein, was noted by an associate of Longy as being a better dentist than a politician, humorously remarking that he was the only mayor that left Newark that didn't have a quarter. He should have stayed at a dentist. Zwilman's connections ensured his protection even when he faced legal troubles. He once went to jail for severely beating a local pimp who had skimmed money from his numbers racket, despite the harshness of his actions, leaving the man with a broken face and severe bruising. Longy received a mild six-month sentence for atrocious assault, purportedly because he felt sympathy due to the victim's race, claiming that was why he did not kill him. While imprisoned, Longy enjoyed privileges unheard of for most inmates. He had a telephone in his cell, received visitors at any hour, and dined on meals prepared outside the prison. According to a friend, Longy was even allowed to leave prison temporarily, spending nights out and about as if he were not incarcerated at all, essentially turning his jail time into a series of daytime naps interrupted by nightly escapades. Upon his release after serving only three months, Longy showed his gratitude through lavish gifts, handing out money to guards and gifting a new car to a jail official. Despite his notorious reputation, Longy remained sensitive to his Jewish heritage. When a close friend passed away, he refrained from entering the chapel for the funeral service due to his status as a Kohen, a descendant of the ancient Hebrew priestly class forbidden from being in the same room as a corpse. This adherence to his religious traditions highlighted a complex persona that juxtaposed his brutal criminal activities with deep cultural loyalties. One of the most unexpected anecdotes from Longy's life involved the actress Jean Harlow, a major sex symbol of the thirties. They met when she was just 19 during a promotional tour for Howard Hughes's film Hell's Angels. This encounter in Newark, where Harlow made a stop, added a Hollywood connection to Longy's storied life, bridging his influence from the gritty streets of Newark to the glitz of celebrity circles, further illustrating the vast reach of his power and influence. Doc Statcher's chance encounter with Gene Harlow at Newark's Adams Theatre marked the beginning of a remarkable chapter in the lives of both Harlow and Abner Longies Wilman. Stature was instantly captivated by Harlow's allure and could not stop talking about her, sparking Zwilman's curiosity. After going to see her himself, Zwilman was instantly smitten. 
He introduced himself to Harlow, and the mutual attraction quickly blossomed into a passionate romance. Zuilman, ever the mentor and protector, took Harlow under his wing, coaching her on everything from her walk and talk to how she dressed and conducted herself in public. He even famously coined the term platinum blonde to describe her distinctive hair colour. The relationship thrived, and Harlow was deeply enamoured with Longy. Their affair lasted until Harlow moved to Hollywood to pursue her burgeoning film career with MGM, marking the end of their intimate connection, but not the impact Zwilman had on her life and career. In the shadowy underworld of 1959, the demise of Abner Zwilman marked a chilling chapter in mob history, orchestrated by none other than Carlo Gambino and his ruthless crew. Zwilman, grappling with severe tax problems, found himself in a precarious position, as his own men harboured fears that he might succumb to the pressures of law enforcement and turn informer. Luciano recounted how Zwilman, desperate and cornered, sought to leverage his influence over Gambino, attempting to strong-arm him into coughing up the cash needed to settle his tax woes. The sum, though not staggering, somewhere between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars, was crucial for Zwilman's survival. Yet, shockingly, his calls for help went unanswered. Gambino, along with Lansky and others, stood back, leaving Zwilman isolated and vulnerable. This betrayal was a stunning revelation for Luciano, especially given the close and affectionate relationship between Lansky and Zwilman. Lansky's failure to intervene not only highlighted his capacity for cold-blooded betrayal, but also signalled a seismic shift in allegiances within the mob. The tragic end to this saga was marked by a brutal act of violence. Zwilman's was mercilessly beaten and hanged in the basement of his home, his lifeless body a grim testament to the merciless nature of mob justice. In the aftermath of Zwilman's assassination, control of his operations swiftly passed to other hands, solidifying the power of the Angelo Bruno faction across multiple crime families. This transition further cemented Gambino's influence, with Bruno's backing reinforcing his standing in Philadelphia and beyond. Luciano, reflecting on these dark events from his exile in Sicily, pointed the finger squarely at Carlo Gambino for the orchestration of Zwilman's untimely death, a move that reshaped the landscape of organized crime and underscored the ruthless machinations that defined their world. Meanwhile, the Prohibition era in Philadelphia was dominated by another formidable figure, Max Boo Boo Hoff. Born in 1893 in Philadelphia to Russian Jewish parents, Hoff was nicknamed Boo Boo during his childhood in the bustling streets of South Philadelphia, a misunderstanding arising when his mother called out Boo, the Hebrew word for come, which his Irish and Italian playmates interpreted as Boo Boo. Hoff started his career modestly as a newsboy and a clerk in a cigar store. He later opened a high-stakes gambling operation that doubled as a political club in Philadelphia's Fifth Ward. His ventures expanded into managing boxers and promoting prize fights, making him a well-known figure in the city's sporting circles. With the advent of Prohibition, Hoff rose to prominence, leading a gang of tough young Jewish hoodlums that controlled a significant portion of Philadelphia's illegal liquor, gambling and other underworld activities. He was also the city's major purchaser of machine guns and bulletproof vests, which he employed effectively against his rivals. Hoff's influence extended beyond Philadelphia. He maintained ties with Jewish mob circles in New York and Newark and was on close terms with Al Capone. By 1927, he was recognized as Philadelphia's King of the Bootleggers. True to his stature, Hoff lived in a luxurious apartment in West Philadelphia and was known for his extravagant hospitality. He was one of the city's most celebrated hosts, famous for hiring hotel ballrooms to entertain local and visiting celebrities, further cementing his reputation as a prominent and influential figure during and after Prohibition. Max Boo Boo Hoff was renowned not only for his control over Philadelphia's Prohibition-era underworld, but also for his generosity towards his associates, 
and critical allies, such as members of the police force. Every Christmas, Hoff distributed thousands of dollars in gifts to police officers, with one notable year, 1926, seeing him give away a total of $250,000 in gifts, apart from his usual bribes. A 1928 grand jury investigation uncovered that over 80 police officers were on Hoff's payroll. When these officers were questioned about their unexplained wealth, their excuses ranged from being lucky in crap games and poker to betting on the right horses. Some even claimed financial windfalls from deceased saloon keepers who left them money in their wills. One police captain absurdly claimed his substantial bank account balance grew from making birdcages on a $2,000 annual salary. With the end of Prohibition, however, Hoff's reign and wealth declined sharply. He invested his fortune into nightclubs and jukebox dance joints, all of which failed, leading to his penniless demise in 1941 after he overdosed on sleeping pills. Hoff's mantle as Philadelphia's preeminent Jewish mobster was taken up by Harry Stromberg, also known as Nig Rosen, a nickname he received due to his dark complexion. Born in Russia in 1902 and immigrating to New York's East Side in 1906, Stromberg's criminal activities began early and included a stint in jail for burglary at age 19. Upon his release, he quickly became embroiled in mob activities within New York's garment industry, working alongside notable figures like Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello. Stromberg eventually relocated to Philadelphia, where he rose to become a major figure in the gambling scene and led the 69th Street Gang, known for its involvement in prostitution, extortion and labour racketeering. His operations expanded to other cities including Washington, Baltimore and Atlantic City. Despite leaving Philadelphia in the 30s, he continued to control parts of its numbers, racket into the 50s, and was identified by the Keyforver Committee as Philadelphia's gambling czar. Later, he allegedly made a fortune smuggling heroin from France, earning $20 million a year before retiring to Florida, where he died in 1984. Following Stromberg, his driver and bodyguard, Willy Weisberg, assumed leadership of Philadelphia's Jewish underworld. Known for his constant battles with law enforcement, Weisberg was so familiar with being tailed by the FBI that he would sometimes invite agents to join him for a drink if he spotted them in a restaurant. During one memorable incident in snowy weather, he even approached FBI agents in their car to share his itinerary sparing them the discomfort of waiting in the cold. Throughout the 40s and 50s, Weisberg was arrested more than 30 times on various charges, from robbery to extortion and violating the Firearms Act, and was barred from entering Philadelphia between 1940 and 1950 by the police. His life encapsulated the enduring, if adversarial, relationship between organised crime figures and law enforcement during that era. During the height of Prohibition, the Jewish Big Six of the East Coast, Charles King Solomon, Longy Zwilman, Maya Lansky, Dutch Schultz, Bugsy Siegel and Lepke Buchhalter, dominated the criminal underworld, wielding substantial influence over illicit activities ranging from bootlegging to gambling. Each of these figures left a significant mark on organised crime, but Charles Solomon's story stands out with its dramatic and violent end. Charles Solomon, known also as Boston Charlie, was at the helm of one of the largest liquor, vice and narcotic smuggling operations in New England. Born in Russia in 1884 and brought to Boston as a child, Solomon grew up in a middle-class home in Boston's West End. Despite the legitimate business run by his father, who owned a theatre, Solomon was drawn to criminal life from a young age, engaging in prostitution, fencing and narcotic smuggling, particularly cocaine and morphine, by his twenties. Solomon's influence over Boston's underworld peaked during the twenties. As a skilled bootlegger, he forged connections with seagrams in Canada and with associates in New York and Chicago, adeptly bribing local authorities to avoid any liquor-related convictions. However, 
Solomon's reign came to a brutal end. He was murdered in the washroom of the Cotton Club in Roxbury, just one day before he was scheduled to testify in court about his smuggling operations. According to witness accounts, after a heated argument overheard by a waitress, Solomon was shot three times by his assailants who fled the scene, leaving him to stagger out of the washroom fatally wounded and uttering, The dirty rats got me. The aftermath of Solomon's death saw his killers apprehended and brought to trial, where three were convicted of armed robbery and sentenced to seven years in jail, while another received a ten to twenty year sentence for manslaughter and armed robbery. Solomon's widow, Bertha, inherited a million dollar estate and remarried a year after his death, choosing a partner outside the criminal sphere. The legacy of these Jewish mobsters illustrates the significant, though often dark, roles they played in shaping the criminal landscape of their time. Their operations were not just confined to their local regions, but connected through a network that spanned much of the East Coast, linking them inextricably to the broader narrative of organized crime in America during Prohibition. In Cleveland, the underworld's reins were held firmly by the Cleveland Four, Morris Moe Dalitz, Morris Kleinman, Sam Tucker, and Louis Rothkopf. Born around the turn of the century, with Tucker hailing from Lithuania and the others born in the US to immigrant parents, these men wielded considerable power. Moe Dalitz emerged as the undisputed leader. Born in Boston in 1900 and raised in Detroit, Dalitz cut his criminal teeth in bootlegging earning a reputation as one of the little Jewish Navy commanders. This gang of Jewish rum runners smuggled alcohol from Canada across the Detroit River, quenching Detroit's insatiable thirst during Prohibition. Initially, Dalitz collaborated with the Purple Gang, Detroit's formidable Jewish mob. However, a falling out with Mafia boss Joseph Zerilli nudged him to relocate his operations to Cleveland. In Cleveland, Dalitz's influence soared. Through a potent mix of bribery, violence and strategic alliances, he and his syndicate dominated the illicit liquor trade from Canada. Their operations were so prolific that Lake Erie was nicknamed the Jewish Lake. Dalitz's gang coexisted and collaborated with the Cleveland Mafia, led by Big Al Polizzi and his Mayfield road crew. Together they crushed rivals, like the Italian Perello and Leonardo families, maintaining a harmonious relationship for years. Post-Prohibition, Dalitz's empire expanded into gambling, operating casinos across Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Indiana. His ventures into bookmaking, pinball, slot machines, and lotteries were joint efforts with the Polizzi's. Nationally, Dalitz was a respected figure in organized crime, forging alliances with America's most notorious mobsters. When Lucky Luciano ascended as a national mafia figure, one of his first acts was to meet with Dalitz in Cleveland. Moe's connections extended to major figures like Abner Zwillman, Bugsy Siegel, Maya Lansky, Joe Adonis, and Frank Costello. In 1952, Dalitz testified at the New York State Crime Commission hearings revealing his close associations within the underworld. His stature was evident when he attended the farewell party for Lucky Luciano aboard the Laura Keene in 1946, alongside mob luminaries such as Lansky, Zwillman, Siegel, Costello, Albert Anastasia, Carlo Gambino and Joe Bonanno, marking a significant moment in mob history. The quartet of Dalitz, Kleinman, Rothkopf, and Tucker withdrew their stakes from Ohio, venturing westward to seize the glittering opportunities of Las Vegas. There, they took over the Desert Inn, heralding their arrival as the formidable Desert Inn Syndicate. Over time, their empire expanded to include iconic landmarks like the Stardust Hotel, securing their reign as titans of the Las Vegas gambling scene for decades. The bonds of partnership were ironclad, the four shared all their ventures equally and maintained a lifelong brotherhood. Dalitz parlayed his illicit profits into astute investments. In the early fifties, he became a major player in the Paradise Development Company, spearheading projects like the Las Vegas Convention Center, 
Sunrise Hospital, a bustling shopping center, and several buildings at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His tenure at the Desert Inn ended in 1966, when he sold it to focus on developing Rancho La Costa, a lavish $100 million resort near San Diego, partially financed by an $87 million loan from the Teamsters Union's pension fund during Jimmy Hoffa's infamous tenure. Hoffa's subsequent disappearance and presumed murder by the Mafia added a sinister note to this chapter. During the 1951 Senate crime hearings, Senator Estes Kefauva pressed Dalits on the origins of his wealth. Now, to get your investments started off, you did get yourself a pretty good little nest egg out of rum running, didn't you? Dalitz's reply was tinged with defiance. Well, I didn't inherit any money, Senator. Despite his stature, standing barely over five feet three inches, Dalitz was a figure of unyielding courage. A vivid testament to his fearless nature occurred in 1964 at the Beverly Rodeo Hotel in Hollywood. Confronted by a belligerent Sonny Liston, the heavyweight champion fueled by excessive whiskey, Dalitz faced him down. After a heated exchange, when Liston threatened physical violence, Dalitz's chilling response was, If you hit me, you better kill me, because if you don't, I'll make one telephone call, and you'll be dead in twenty-four hours. Liston walked away. Dalitz's financial acumen earned him a spot among America's elite. By 1982, Forbes magazine listed him as one of the nation's 400 wealthiest individuals, with a fortune estimated at $110 million. Across Lake Erie, Detroit's formidable Purple Gang, an all-Jewish mob led by the transplanted New Yorker Ray Bernstein, ruled the city's underworld during Prohibition. The gang, notorious for its bootlegging and narcotics operations, was so infamous that in 1932, Detroit police sent a dossier of 50 gang members to the FBI, detailing their criminal engagements. Ten were imprisoned, seven wanted for murder and kidnapping, four deceased, and 28 were fugitives. In contrast, Chicago's West Side, home to a substantial East European Jewish population and one of the city's poorest quarters, produced figures like Louis Diamond Louis Cowan and Jaime the Loudmouth Levine. Yet, despite these formidable characters, the city's criminal landscape during Prohibition was dominated by Irish and Italian mobs, with Al Scarface Capone at the helm. By an intriguing twist of destiny, Al Capone's chief business strategist and financial confidant was a Jew named Jack Greasy Thumb Guzik, whom Capone famously declared as the only friend I can really trust. This dynamic duo contrasted sharply in appearance and demeanor. Capone was the epitome of sartorial elegance, always clad in custom-tailored suits, whereas Guzik was notably disheveled, his clothing often stained with the remnants of meals past, and, as Capone's driver, George Meyer, once quipped, he was no stranger to body odor. Their alliance was cemented under dramatic circumstances. Guzik once overheard a plot to assassinate Capone and promptly alerted him, a favor that Capone never forgot, ensuring Guzik's safety henceforth. Their bond was put to a critical test one fateful May evening in 1924. A bloodied Guzik stumbled into Capone's office at the Four Deuces nightclub, having been roughed up by Joe Howard, a notorious hijacker. Infuriated by the attack on his trusted adviser, Capone located Howard in a nearby saloon, boasting about his assault. Confronted by Capone and unrepentant, Howard insulted him further, provoking Capone to fatally shoot him at point-blank range. At Howard's inquest, conveniently, no witnesses could recall anything significant, adding another unsolved mystery to Chicago's violent history. Born in Russia in 1886 and immigrating to the U.S. at a young age, Guzik grew up in a family supported modestly by a small cigar store. He ventured early into the less savoury aspects of nightlife, managing his brother Harry's brothel, where he cynically observed the corrupt dealings of local law enforcement and judiciary. Guzik's disdain for the Gentile judges was palpable. 
he openly expressed his contempt, never missing a chance to criticize their integrity. When prohibition swept the nation, Guzik aligned with Johnny Torrio's gang, where he first met Capone. Following the Howard incident, Guzik ascended as Capone's indispensable lieutenant, a role he maintained under Capone's successors, from Frank the Waiter Rica to Tony Accardo, all of whom valued his shrewd judgment. The origin of his moniker Greasy Thumb is debated. Some say it referred to his slippery handling of money, others to his clumsy beginnings as a waiter. Despite earning a million dollars between 1927 and 1929, Guzik was scrutinized by the IRS and served five years for tax evasion, during which he was diagnosed with various health issues and determined to have limited intelligence. In his later years, Guzik became a vocal critic, especially of the judiciary, which he claimed could be bought as easily as scrap metal. His scathing views on corruption made him a colourful figure to the press. However, he also became sensitive about his public portrayal, leading to a lawsuit against the Chicago American newspaper for a less than flattering profile, which described him in terms not just critical but mocking, capturing the essence of a man who was as complex as he was controversial. Jack Guzik took his grievances against the Hearst Publishing Company to court, accusing them of libel. However, despite his investments in local judicial connections, Judge Quilici of the Municipal Court dismissed his suit. His friends urged him to move on, but Guzik was resolute. I'm paying those judges, he protested, so why shouldn't I use them? Yet victory in court eluded him. Still he remained undeterred, continuing to pursue legal action repeatedly. Guzik believed firmly in the power of litigation as a tool for intimidation. Never be afraid to sue, he advised his criminal allies. Go into court at the drop of a hat any time you don't like what some newspaper guy writes. You pay your lawyers a retainer. The judges are on our payrolls. You can sue in Cook County for $15. Just the fact that a suit has been filed will cause most people to shut up. They can never be sure that some nutty jury won't award you a million dollars in damages. This was sharp reasoning from a man with an IQ of 82. In the turbulent world of organized crime during the mid-20th century, figures like Jake Guzik, Sam Giancana, and Russell Buffalino wielded not only brute force, but also sophisticated legal strategies to shield their operations. These mobsters, aware of the power of the press, took aggressive steps to manage their public image by suing newspapers that dared to print damaging articles about them. Sam Giancana, although lacking the extensive power of some of his peers, managed to successfully sue newspaper companies. His victories were notable, yet constrained by Tony Accardo's influence, who never allowed Giancana to pursue such legal actions more than once. This reflected a tactical restraint within the mob, balancing the public skirmishes with media and maintaining their shadowy operations concealed. Russell Buffalino and Jake Guzik also engaged in their share of legal battles against the press. Jake commanded immense respect within the underworld, akin to Chicago's version of Frank Costello. His expertise extended beyond mere muscle. He was a master of political corruption and a strategic genius with numbers. His influence helped expand the family's gambling operations into Las Vegas and further entrenched the Mafia's reach into California and the Midwestern states. Jake's prowess in navigating both the underworld and the corridors of political power made him an indispensable figure in the Mafia's expansion. His sudden death left a significant void, evidenced profoundly at his funeral. The scene at his burial was striking, a testament to his broad influence. Despite his Jewish heritage, the funeral drew an overwhelming number of Catholic Italian mobsters, overshadowing the Jewish attendees. This unusual congregation stunned the Jewish rabbi presiding over the ceremony, illustrating Jake's formidable standing and respect across the diverse factions of organized crime. His legacy, marked by a blend of ruthlessness and strategic acumen, highlighted the complex interplay of ethnicity, religion and power 
within the fabric of the American Mafia. One man rose to dominate the underworld. His unmatched power and unrivaled intellect, combined with his ruthless determination, allowed him to forge alliances across various ethnic communities, not only Jewish, but also Irish and Italian. By 1932, he became a central figure in organized crime, wielding influence over New York City and beyond. What set these men apart was their move into Louisiana, a region traditionally dominated by Christian Protestants, far-right groups, and the Ku Klux Klan. However, Louisiana was rife with corruption. During Prohibition, New York's speakeasies and nightclubs thrived underground, with gambling operations even more concealed. In contrast, Louisiana, where gambling was illegal, yet tourism flourished, showcased its vices openly. Rampant prostitution, gambling, and narcotics. Louisiana was also a cultural melting pot, its food and music scenes contributing to its allure. It was a state where, despite societal taboos, homosexuality found a degree of acceptance, particularly in the seedy nightclubs that catered to the community. Places where rumors of J. Edgar Hoover's compromising situations by the Louisiana Mafia were whispered, though never proven. Under the influence of mob leaders like Frank Costello, Maya Lansky, Charlie Luciano, Huey Long, Silver Dollar Sam, and Carlos Marcello, Louisiana transformed into a strategic hub for organized crime. Luciano famously remarked that Louisiana was worth platinum to us, and Costello considered it the best investment ever made. This state became central to international crime communications as Lansky expanded operations into Havana, Cuba and the Bahamas, areas under the sway of Corsican and Cuban gangsters. These mafia families, fleeing Mussolini's crackdown in Italy, strategically relocated to places like Brazil and South America, using Louisiana, particularly New Orleans, as a communications nexus. The state's endemic corruption made it an ideal center for money laundering. These mobsters heavily invested in industries such as oil, transportation, and real estate, securing significant control and paving the way for further expansions, including negotiations with the Corsican and Cuban mafias and the Traficante crime family. The mafia's roots in the United States extended to Cuba in the early 1920s, initially through the lucrative rum-running trade. However, it was at the close of 1933 that the groundwork for a sprawling criminal empire was laid following pivotal negotiations between the newly promoted Colonel Batista and Maya Lansky, famously dubbed the Mafia's Financier. These talks, orchestrated on the direct command of the notorious Charles Lucky Luciano, set the stage for a tightly coordinated operation under the oversight of four formidable Mafia families helmed by Amadeo Barletta, Santo Traficante Sr., Maya Lansky, and the Corsican Amleto Battisti Laura. In 1935, Battisti Laura took charge of the Hotel Sevilla Biltmore, an opulent establishment erected at a staggering cost of two and a half million pesos in US gold, its foundation rooted in a mortgage originating in 1922 and financed by the Citibank Farmers Trust Company. With this acquisition, Battisti established his luxurious command center in Havana's most prestigious district, a mere stone's throw from the presidential palace. His ambitions soon led him to find the Banco de Créditos e Inversiones in 1937, underpinning his vast array of ventures. Amadeo Barletta, meanwhile, was whispered to be the covert steward of Mussolini's familial interests in the States, a claim bolstered by his later confirmed role as a double agent in the Caribbean. Notably, the FBI placed him on its blacklist by February 7, 1942. Forewarned by Mafia intelligence networks, Barletta narrowly evaded capture and fled to Argentina. Post-World War II, he resurfaced in Havana, now representing major US corporations and holding substantial stakes in the automotive and pharmaceutical industries. He erected the Ambar Motors building on Infanta Street and the Malecon, launched Channel 2 on Cuban television, and took control of the newspaper El Mundo. 
his enterprise expanded rapidly, backed by the Banco Atlantico and a plethora of shell companies. Santo Traficante Sr.'s involvement in Cuba traces back to secretive negotiations between Lansky and Colonel Batista. An experienced gambling operator from the southern United States, Traficante became Lansky's deputy and eventually assumed control of all mafia operations in Cuba. During this period, he also orchestrated the infiltration of various Cuban political groups with undercover agents to maintain mafia influence over Havana's political landscape. From the 1930s onwards, a diverse cohort of Sicilian, Corsican, Jewish and US mafiosi directly managed Havana's underworld. However, by the 1940s, Cuban nationals were integrated into this management structure, though they never ascended to the rank of boss. This strategy allowed the mafia not only to wield visible power, but also to subtly control opposition groups, shaping future political trajectories on the island. Undoubtedly, the linchpin of this mafia dominion was Maya Lansky, anointed as the architect and supreme leader of what became known as the Empire of Havana. His strategic genius and ruthless efficiency cemented his status as the second-in-command of the U.S. Mafia, orchestrating an era of unprecedented criminal enterprise in Cuba. In the 1930s, Maya Lansky emerged as a pioneering figure like what we now call an angel investor, particularly around Havana, Cuba and other burgeoning hotspots. Unlike traditional investors who support startups, Lansky's focus was on identifying businesses within the gambling and casino sectors that were ripe for growth but needed financial backing and strategic guidance. He sought out gambling operations and mob-run businesses that had the potential to expand and started investing in them. Lansky's method was to provide capital and support to these ventures, helping them to take over other rackets. He made it clear to the mobsters and gangsters running these operations that they would continue to lead their own criminal outfits as bosses of their syndicates. However, Lansky's condition was control over the finances. By managing the books, he could streamline operations, ensuring every cent was accounted for. This financial oversight allowed him to control the operations indirectly, boost their profitability, and demonstrate his value to these criminal syndicates. Gradually, Lansky built a reputation as a reliable, hard-working businessman, capable of transforming modest casino operations into highly profitable enterprises. His success in quadrupling profits not only solidified his standing within the criminal underworld, but also facilitated his integration into safer, more respected segments of society in Havana. Here, Lansky became a strategic asset to influential figures such as Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista. Batista, like many politicians in America and around the world, including figures like Huey Long, Al Smith, FDR, and later Richard Nixon, sought financial security and wealth leveraging their positions of power to amass riches and eventually retire comfortably in sunny foreign locales. Lansky understood this dynamic and positioned himself as an indispensable intermediary. He helped establish banking havens for politicians, judges, senators and other public officials, not just in America, but internationally. He facilitated the creation of bank accounts in Switzerland before and post-World War II, and later in British-controlled island territories. By the 1960s, Lansky's clandestine dealings extended to collaboration with British elites to develop casino and gambling operations in the Bahamas, further cementing his influence and extending his reach within the spheres of both legitimate and illicit enterprises. Maya Lansky's strategic move into Havana, Cuba, was fraught with danger from the outset, and he never even knew the amount of trouble it would bring him. When Charles Lucky Luciano was imprisoned, Lansky's aggressive expansion into the Cuban gambling scene began to stir unrest among established crime families already operating there. This revealed that Lansky had skillfully navigated around these groups, 
and managed to gain governmental backing, leveraging it as a strategic advantage. He believed that his amassed position and power rendered him untouchable. However, the dynamics changed when Luciano demanded a meeting with Lansky in prison. During this crucial encounter, Luciano made it clear that Lansky's solo endeavours were unsustainable. He instructed Lansky to integrate other crime families into his operations, particularly those from the South, who were deeply entrenched in Havana and other areas of Cuba. Luciano emphasised the importance of inclusivity in these lucrative rackets to maintain peace and order among the various mob factions. To solidify his operations and appease the established mob powers, Lansky brought key mafia figures into the fold. This included notorious mobsters such as Russell Bufalino, Jimmy Blue Eyes, Arlo, Stefano Magadino, and elements of the Chicago outfit. Initially, their investment remained minimal, but the landscape shifted significantly in the 40s when Tony Accardo took leadership of the Chicago outfit. Additionally, Carlos Marcello, Santo Traficante, and their extensive network, which included Cuban gangsters, began to play a more prominent role in Lansky's Cuban ventures. And before Luciano left Havana in 1947, he became a shareholder in the Hotel Nacional in Havana. Lansky was deeply impressed by Carlos Marcello's operations, where he saw off-duty police officers employed to protect his casinos. These officers received better salaries from their security roles than their official police work, prompting Lansky to adopt a similar model in key locations like Cuba. He hired soldiers and police officers for roles ranging from bodyguards and chauffeurs to casino staff. This strategy not only added a layer of legitimacy, but also further entangled the state with organized crime. In certain areas, these crime figures employed right-wing mercenaries as private police forces to manage tourist hotspots and enforce segregation. John Martino emerged as a notable figure within this context, managing casino operations on behalf of Santo Traficante. His roles were diverse. He was a political figure, a soldier, and a key liaison for the Mafia in maintaining connections with Fidel Castro. Martino was also involved in the Bay of Pigs invasion and has been rumoured to be linked to the Kennedy assassination. His multifaceted involvement highlights the complex interplay between organised crime, political events and historical impacts. These individuals were not merely business investors. They acted as a private government, particularly in places like Havana and other regions. Post-World War II, Similar tactics were used by Britain to maintain control in locations such as the Bahamas, showcasing the widespread influence and adaptation of these methods in various international settings. Through these strategic alliances, Lansky managed to not only mitigate the threat posed by other crime families, but also strengthen his position in the complex web of organised crime. His ability to weave through these dangerous waters showcased his adeptness at both negotiation and strategy, marking him as a formidable figure in the underworld of mid-20th century America and Cuba. In 1932, Maya Lansky was indeed taking what could be considered the initial tentative steps towards becoming a formidable player in organized crime. This period marked a critical juncture for the American mafia, especially as the structures established by Charles Lucky Luciano had rendered the organization both powerful and, paradoxically, vulnerable. The major weakness was the high public profile of these mob figures. Notorious gangsters like Luciano, dubbed the Prime Minister of the Underworld, Frank Costello, Dutch Schultz known as the Baron, and Louis Lepke Buchalter, infamously called Little Louis the Killer, had become household names, making them easy targets for law enforcement. The visibility of these mobsters was a double-edged sword. While it elevated their status within the underworld, it also made them prime targets for a government crackdown. When Franklin D. Roosevelt took office, he ushered in a new era of aggressive action against organized crime. Al Capone, the most famous gangster of the era, was already imprisoned for tax evasion by this time. 
setting a precedent for targeting high-profile criminals. Capone's eventual demise in 1947 as a free but broken man underscored the effectiveness of this strategy. From 1932 to 1936, the US government intensified its efforts to dismantle the Mafia's grip on various sectors, particularly after the end of Prohibition, which had been a significant source of revenue for these crime syndicates. The elimination of Prohibition revenue streams forced figures like Luciano, Lansky, Costello and Bugsy Siegel to pivot and explore new avenues for their illicit activities. It was during this time of vulnerability that Lansky's role in organised crime deepened, showing his strategic acumen by beginning to set the foundations for future operations, including those in Havana. As these mob leaders worked to rebuild their empires, the government continued to close in, exploiting their weakened state. Luciano's imprisonment in 1936 was a significant blow to the Mafia, illustrating the effectiveness of the government's strategy. Lansky, witnessing these developments, recognised the importance of adaptation and began to craft a new vision for organised crime that included international expansions and more sophisticated financial operations, paving the way for his later ventures in Cuba and beyond. This period was crucial in shaping the trajectory of organised crime, with Lansky at the forefront of its evolution. Meyer Lansky found himself managing multiple fronts beyond his usual criminal and business operations. His responsibilities extended into his personal life, particularly his commitment to his son's well-being. As he watched his son struggle and suffer, Lansky was not just a passive observer. He actively sought the best possible treatments, meticulously researching to find a cure. His confrontation with this painful reality was a stark contrast to his otherwise orderly professional life, highlighting his deep paternal dedication amidst his complex circumstances. Meyer Lansky, confronted with the reality of his son Buddy's physical retardation due to cerebral palsy or spinal cord damage, struggled with the situation, emblematic of his difficulty in handling personal crises. Moses Polakoff, the family's lawyer and friend, noted Meyer's discomfort and withdrawal in the face of Buddy's disability, highlighting a characteristic tendency to pull away from situations beyond his control. This response was compounded by rumours that Meyer initially reacted to his son's diagnosis by distancing himself from his family, a narrative that troubled Buddy into adulthood. Despite these challenges, Meyer's approach to dealing with his son's condition was methodical and informed. He dedicated himself to understanding cerebral palsy, researching extensively and seeking out specialists capable of providing effective treatment. This proactive and resourceful stance demonstrated Meyer's deep, if privately held, commitment to his family's well-being, underscoring the complexity of his emotional landscape and his determination to confront and manage the challenges presented by his son's disability. Meyer Lansky's commitment to seeking a cure for his son Buddy's condition led him and his family across the country, from New York to California, and even to international efforts, including bringing an Austrian orthopaedic surgeon to New York. Despite these exhaustive efforts, including treatments in Hot Springs, Arkansas, no definitive solution was found. Just before Christmas of 1933, prohibition was finally swept away. For 14 years, Americans had wrestled with their consciences over whether to break the law and drink illegally or remain upright citizens and go thirsty. The desire for alcohol had won, and the major beneficiaries had been the bootleggers and their underworld associates. Now that the sale of illegal alcohol was no longer an important source of income, many underworld leaders moved to gambling, prostitution and drug running. But the shrewder criminals, like the Lower East Side outfit, had long since made plans to also move into the legitimate business of importing whiskey, as Rothstein, Torrio and Costello, as well as Al Smith, had predicted. Lansky went one better than the other leaders, for although he joined his partners in setting up legitimate companies dealing in alcohol, including import businesses, as well as the transformation of speakeasies into restaurants and nightclubs, he realised 
that the sale of untaxed liquor could still be a highly profitable operation. Legal whiskey was heavily taxed. The bootleg equivalent could be sold more cheaply and more profitably. Lansky had set up the Malaska Corporation partly with this in mind. Incorporated in Ohio by Lansky and his amiable father-in-law in 1933, the firm's stated purpose was the processing of dehydrated molasses to be used as a substitute for sugar. Other unofficial partners in the business included Mo Dalitz, Charles Polizzi, known as Chuck, and Sam Tucker. Citron took an active part, investing over $120,000 in Malaska. The genuine business, of course, was to use molasses in alcohol. It is an excellent flavoring agent. There were Malaska plants in various places, including New Jersey and Ohio. The business was skillfully operated, and the premises were moved from time to time to avoid detection by the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms Bureau. Even so, occasionally one of the distilleries was raided. After the discovery of one of Malaska's plants in New Jersey, the New York Times told its readers that enough illicit alcohol had been found there to flood New York and New Jersey. The journalist's figure of speech gave an inkling of the size of the enterprise. Millions of gallons of illegal booze were produced, and much of it was sold to the legitimate firms set up by underworld leaders who were, of course, close friends of Lansky. Lansky's cautious nature was becoming more evident. In Malaska, he surrounded himself with colleagues and employees who acted as his front men, and he distanced himself from his gambling and other enterprises by operating farther and farther away from the scene of the action. He was cushioned by his friends, and his own name was rarely mentioned in the newspapers. Charlie Luciano, on the other hand, now began to pay the price for his enjoyment of publicity, as Roosevelt's war against criminals started up in earnest. Turning ruthlessly on the underworld, FDR gave all the backing he could to the new wave of law enforcement officers who were determined to smash crime and win reputations. One such enthusiastic wielder of the sword of justice was Thomas E. Dewey, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. He had already struck at the underworld by jailing Waxy Gordon with the help of Jake Lansky, Charlie Luciano, and Meyer Lansky, who was prosecuted in New York. In the gritty tableau of organized crime's history, Waxy Gordon's rise and fall epitomizes the brutal realities of mob loyalty and betrayal. Initially a trusted lieutenant within the mob, Gordon's close ties with Lucky Luciano and critical role in several rescues cemented his position in the underworld. However, the dynamics shifted dramatically as a fierce rivalry burgeoned between Gordon and Maya Lansky. Despite Gordon's proven allegiance, Luciano sided with Lansky, a decision that marked the beginning of Gordon's downfall. Lansky, strategically manoeuvring against Gordon, first leaked crucial information about him to the IRS. This information eventually found its way to the formidable prosecutor, Tom Dewey, leading to Gordon's imprisonment and the dismantling of his empire, which subsequently fell into the hands of Lansky and Luciano. After serving his sentence, Gordon attempted a comeback in the narcotics trade, but once again he was thwarted by Luciano and Lansky. In a stark display of betrayal, they turned him over to the authorities again, resulting in another lengthy imprisonment and effectively ending his reign in the criminal underworld. This era, particularly during Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration, marked a turning point in the war on organized crime. Mobsters realized that high visibility and public exposure, being photographed at elite events and making conspicuous appearances, were detrimental. Such notoriety led to increased scrutiny and vulnerability. The landscape of organized crime was changing. The days of flamboyant gangster personas were giving way to a more discreet, calculated approach. Learning from the fallout of their high profile activities, mobsters in the post Roosevelt era adopted more covert strategies. They began to expertly utilize front men, ranging from union leaders to lawyers, to orchestrate their illicit dealings, thus shielding their operations from direct association with crime. 
Moreover, they invested in both legitimate and illegitimate front companies, creating complex layers of deception that allowed them to manipulate political and economic spheres with reduced risk of exposure. This strategic evolution reflected a broader shift within the world of organized crime, from overt acts of defiance against the law to a more clandestine manipulation of the system, ensuring their survival and continuity in the shadows of American society. Now, FDR, Samuel Seabury, LaGuardia, and Tom Dewey launched an all-out attack against one of the men allied with Lansky and Luciano. Stockily built, the blue-eyed Bronx-born gangster known as Dutch Schultz had started out as a printer but joined a gang of criminals called the Bergen Avenue Mob when he was still in his teens. Hold-ups and burglaries were his initial plunge into crime before he became associated with Lansky, Phil Castle, and Luciano. Schultz had been Lansky's partner since the incredibly early bootlegging days. When Dewey sent out the message that he was gunning for a major mafia figure in New York, he made it clear that his first target was Dutch Schultz, but that he was also after Lucky Luciano. Dewey found a powerful ally in the new mayor of New York, the little flower Fiorello LaGuardia, who was elected in January 1934 on the fusion platform that promised a fight against Tammany corruption as well as the New York underworld. No sooner was LaGuardia in office than he ordered his police commissioner, Louis J. Valentine, to make the war against criminals his number one priority. It was clear to the Lower East Siders that both Dewey and LaGuardia were serious and that they had strong public support for their aims. The underworld tried to set up defences against the attack and at the same time continue their highly profitable activities. Dutch Schultz went into hiding and Lansky and Luciano, with Zwilman, Adonis, Lepke, Lucchese and Genovese, conferred about how to neutralise Tom Dewey. Dutch Schultz had already given his partners a lot of trouble because he sometimes declined to follow their modern approach of downplaying violence and operating on a business-like basis. One of Schultz's notorious specialties was to threaten restaurant owners with death or with their premises being blown up if they did not pay him protection money. Even while on the run from the police, he continued killing people he considered his rivals, including Jack Legs Diamond, who may have been encroaching on Schultz's protection territory in the Bronx and parts of Manhattan. Besides Schultz's recent murders, what alarmed the Lower East Side leaders far more was that he was openly declaring that the only way to escape Dewey's clutches was to kill him. If that happened, the leaders knew that the public and the authorities would turn venomously against them. The whole array of American law enforcement agencies would be forced by public pressure to bring them all to trial. Meantime, Dutch Schultz's behaviour became more unpredictable and erratic. The strain of hiding out and the fear of capture were taking their toll on a man used to tough direct action. To the surprise of his fellow Jews in the underworld, he decided to convert to Roman Catholicism. This was accepted with raised eyebrows, but after that he made the unpardonable error of having one of Lansky's closest friends, Abraham Bo Weinberg, killed. The Dutchman, as he was known, had decided that Weinberg was working behind his back to divide up his holdings among the rest of the Lower East Side gangsters. Schultz was ranting and raving, Doc Stature remembered. There was already great hostility between him and the rest of the gang. Times were starting to get tough for Meyer Lansky. However, the Lansky family's residential moves, from Brooklyn to prestigious addresses in Manhattan, including the Majestic at 72nd and Central Park West, illustrate Meyer's success and financial capability. Unlike his associate Charlie Luciano's more flamboyant lifestyle, Lansky opted for a less ostentatious, though still upscale, living situation, signalling a preference for a certain level of discretion even within his wealth display. Anne Lansky's enjoyment of the lifestyle that Meyer's success afforded them is evident in their shopping excursions on Fifth Avenue, particularly at Wilmer's, a favourite spot that also attracted the company of friends within their social circle, including Florence Allo, who was the wife of Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo. 
1929 was a pivotal year in Jimmy Blue Eye's life. It was the year he met Florence Miller, known as Flo Hart, who would become his wife, and Maya Lansky, the man with whom he would form a lifelong association. Jimmy Blue Eyes explained how he met Maya in his own book called Me and Jimmy Blue Eyes, written by Carol Cortland Russo. Carol was raised by Jimmy Blue Eyes like she was his own daughter. Jimmy would tell Carol all about Lansky. I had a friend, Mike Lascari, who was in the beer business. Some guys I knew wanted to kill him and take over his business. I did not think that was right, so I got a hold of him and told him to lay low for a while. His partner at the time was Charlie Lucky Luciano. Mike appreciated me letting him know what was going on, and he asked me to meet with Charlie about this. When we met, he had this little guy with him. That was Maya Lansky. I had never heard of him, but we were immediately attracted to one another. He was a man of principle. We could talk about a lot of things. I cannot think of anyone that I admire more than Maya. He really educated me. During the early 1930s, Jimmy's friendship with Maya deepened. They were alike in many ways, avid readers, interested in history and current affairs, both low-key and soft-spoken. They possessed common sense, a quality that Mark Twain said was not very common, a quote Jimmy enjoyed repeating. They also shared a ruthlessness when necessary, insisting on honour as they understood it. While Jimmy made a living with the numbers, Maya focused on Saratoga Springs in upstate New York. This elegant summer resort offered horse racing, therapeutic baths, Victorian hotels, fine dining, and casinos. Though gambling was illegal, local authorities had turned a blind eye for decades. Arnold Rothstein had operated in Saratoga since the 20s, and now Maya took over the most successful casino, the Piping Rock. His principal partners were Frank Costello, owner of the Copacabana in Manhattan, and Joseph Doto, a.k.a. Joe Adonis. These were transitional years for Jimmy and Maya. They had propelled themselves out of poverty, survived prohibition, and become family men. They wanted to leave behind the rash acts of their youth and craved respectability, hoping money could buy it. In 1930, Maya's wife, Anne, gave birth to a son, Bernard, who was called Buddy. By the middle of his second year, Buddy was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Anne believed this was God's retribution for Maya's sins and constantly berated him. Under the stress of his wife's accusations, Maya broke down. He and Jimmy travelled to Boston, rented a hotel room, and Maya, normally abstinent, went on a week-long binge. Jimmy stayed with his friend as he cried and drank. Finally, Maya pulled himself together, and they returned to Manhattan, never mentioning it again. Maya and Anne moved into the Majestic, a luxury apartment building on 77th Street and Central Park West, where they occasionally shared the elevator with columnist and neighbour Walter Winchell. Walter was also a good friend of J. Edgar Hoover, and would help Maya Lansky, Frank Costello, and Charlie Luciano imprison Lepka. Ben and Esther Siegel lived at the Waldorf Astoria, as did Charlie Lucky. Jimmy and Flo had an apartment on 72nd Street at 22 Riverside Drive. All three women shopped at Wilmer's, an exclusive dress shop on 57th Street. They spent hours in comfortable chairs, sipping coffee and gossiping, while their favourite sales ladies brought them things to try on. Flo yearned for the finer things, insisting on a Steinway baby grand piano. She hired a piano teacher who came to the apartment twice a week. Despite her appreciation for elegance, she had a down-to-earth quality, meeting the teacher in a house dress and bedroom slippers without makeup or a hairdo. One evening, Flo and Anne, seeking culture, attended a concert at Carnegie Hall. As they descended a sweeping staircase, Flo, gloriously coiffed and gowned, spotted the piano teacher. She went over to say, hello, but he stared blankly at her, not recognising her. She and Anne found this hilarious. 
there is a snapshot of Jimmy sitting astride a horse, outfitted in equestrian finery, wearing riding boots and carrying a riding crop. In another photo taken the same day, he is seated on the steps of the Arlington Hotel, surrounded by four men, one with his arms draped casually around Jimmy's shoulders. Lounging above the group is Ben Siegel, wearing a cap and smoking a cigar. Although Jimmy enjoyed his wife's company, he was happiest in the company of his male friends. They loved him, and he loved them in return. Jimmy and Flo went together like ham and eggs, but while he enjoyed his wife's company, Jimmy was happiest with his male friends. Jimmy and Flo were a dazzling couple, often photographed as they dined and clubbed with friends in Manhattan, Saratoga and Havana. Every night was a night out, with favourite spots like Dinty Moors for homestyle cooking, Villanova for Italian food, and the former speakeasy, Frankie and Johnny's, for the best steaks and chops. One place Jimmy went without flow was Hot Springs, Arkansas, a trip he made a couple of times a year. There, good-natured kibitzing and practical jokes were common, like the time Jimmy borrowed Ben's golf clubs in Hot Springs and broke one. When Ben found out, he yelled, Hey, one of my clubs is missing. Jimmy responded, Like hell we will. Maya's humour tended toward dry observation, which Uncle Jim always appreciated. Once, while having dinner with Maya and Anne at Ben and Esther Siegel's house on Long Island, Esther, who was a bit pretentious, mentioned she was studying French. Maya, in his quiet voice, said, Don't you think you should learn English first? Everyone laughed, including Jimmy, enjoying the humour and camaraderie of their close-knit group. This aspect of their life highlights not just the Lansky's social connections, but also Anne's role in navigating and enjoying the upper echelons of New York society, facilitated by Meyer's financial acumen and criminal enterprise-derived wealth. The interior design choices of Anne Lansky, Esther Siegel, and Flo Allo facilitated by Ada Hector, emphasised both luxury and individual style, with a particular emphasis on high-quality wallpaper that made a clear statement about their financial status. The Lansky family's apartment in the Majestic, with its view of Central Park, combined natural beauty with the interior comfort and style, including a library den for Meyer that reflected his intellect and meticulous nature. This setting, complemented by Meyer Lansky's precise and elegant personal style, evidenced by his preference for silk shirts from Sulka, suits from Maurice and ties by Countess Mara, paints a picture of a family that, despite its ties to criminal enterprises, pursued a life of cultured sophistication and comfort. The birth of Paul Lansky and the family's move to Boston to seek treatment for Buddy highlight a pivotal moment in the Lansky family's life demonstrating Maya's commitment to his son's well-being over his business interests. This decision underscores a different aspect of Lansky's character, often overshadowed by his notorious reputation. A devoted father willing to prioritise his family's needs and invest in their future. The juxtaposition of Lansky's meticulous approach to both his personal appearance and the management of his criminal activities with his determined pursuit of medical treatment for Buddy reveals a complex individual navigating the challenges of his dual worlds. The Lansky family's relocation to Boston was marked by both hope and hardship as they sought treatment for Buddy's cerebral palsy under Dr. Carruthers. The therapies were rigorous and demanding, reflecting a period of intense emotional and physical challenge for the family, particularly for Buddy and his mother Anne, who became his primary caretaker during these long stretches of treatment. Anne's dedication to Buddy's care, despite her own frayed nerves and lack of domestic inclinations, highlights her resilience and deep maternal love. Maya Lansky's role in this period was complicated. His financial generosity and determination to find the best treatment for Buddy contrasted with his emotional distance and difficulty in expressing affection directly. This pattern of behaviour suggests a man deeply committed to his family's well-being, yet uncomfortable with the vulnerabilities that come with close personal connections. The Lansky children, Buddy and Paul, displayed a mischievous energy, 
engaging in childhood antics that brought moments of levity and normalcy to a family navigating significant challenges. Their relationship with their parents, especially their father, Maya, was shaped by his intermittent physical presence and emotional distance, despite his attempts to provide materially for his family. This snapshot of the Lansky family during their time in Boston offers a glimpse into the complex dynamics at play, balancing the strains of Buddy's disability with the efforts to maintain a semblance of normal family life. It underscores the multifaceted nature of Maya Lansky, a figure known for his criminal activities, yet also a father grappling with the demands of parenthood under difficult circumstances. Maya Lansky's relationship with his family encapsulates the complexities and contradictions that characterized much of his life. His devotion to his mother, Yetta, and the lengths he went to ensure her comfort and care, especially in her later years, highlight a side of Lansky that contrasts sharply with his public persona as a mobster. Yetta's role as the matriarch and the warmth and respect between her and Maya underscore a familial bond steeped in affection and mutual admiration. This connection, nurtured through regular visits, long conversations, and Maya's meticulous attention to her medical and personal needs, paints a picture of a son deeply committed to his mother's well-being. Conversely, Maya's relationship with his father, Max, was fraught with tension and disappointment. Max's disapproval of Maya's chosen path and lifestyle created a rift that seemed insurmountable. The divergence in their values, especially regarding Jewish traditions and the upbringing of Maya's children, underscored the generational and ideological gap between them. Max's dismay at Maya's disregard for religious education and customs, such as the Cheda and Bar Mitzvah ceremonies, reflects a deeper conflict over identity and legacy. Maya's indifference towards these traditions, seen in his embrace of American customs like celebrating Christmas, further alienated him from his father's expectations. The upbringing of Maya's sons, Buddy and Paul, without a strong connection to their Jewish heritage, reveals Maya's complex relationship with his own identity. His refusal to engage with traditional Jewish practices, possibly as a reaction against perceived limitations and prejudices, indicates a deliberate choice to forge a new path that diverged from his father's values. This decision, while creating a sense of freedom and assimilation for Maya and his family, also contributed to a sense of loss and disconnection from their cultural and religious roots. Maya Lansky's life, marked by his achievements and controversies in the criminal underworld, was equally shaped by his personal relationships and family dynamics. The contrast between his deep affection for his mother and his strained relationship with his father mirrors the broader tensions between tradition and modernity, between adherence to the past and the pursuit of a new American identity. As Lansky navigated these complex waters, his choices and actions reflected a man who was at once a devoted son, a controversial figure, and a father grappling with his legacy. The world was in turmoil, and Maya Lansky stood in the eye of the storm. The 1929 Great Depression sent shockwaves across America and rippled throughout the globe. Just a few years earlier, in 1925, Mussolini had seized power in Italy. His iron-fisted far-right regime waged relentless war against the Mafia, forcing a massive exodus of Sicilian Italians. These exiles arrived in America with one grim determination, to spread organized crime and establish their dominion. They initially rallied under Maranzano's banner, but after his demise, the mantle fell to the cunning Charlie Luciano. As the 1930s unfolded, the specter of fascism loomed large over Europe. Inspired by Mussolini, a man named Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany, and by 1933 he had a stranglehold on the nation. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, a curious incident occurred. In 1929, as the Great Depression unfolded, Winston Churchill was in New York, 
wandering the chaotic streets of Wall Street, witnessing firsthand the seismic shifts reshaping the world. Fast forward to May 1940, and the drums of war thundered across Western Europe. With German forces advancing relentlessly, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain resigned in disgrace. King George VI urgently summoned Churchill, asking him to take the helm as Prime Minister. With unyielding resolve, Churchill declared all-out war on Nazi Germany, vowing to halt their dominion over Europe and safeguard the British Empire. However, the end of the Second World War did not bring the peace Churchill envisioned. The Russian-Soviet Union tightened its grip on half of Europe, while the other half lay in tatters. Britain's victory came at a steep price. The nation was bankrupt, and its empire lay in ruins. As the 1950s dawned, Britain transformed into a banking powerhouse, its doors wide open to the murky world of organised crime. Back in the swirling maelstrom of the mid-30s America, the worlds of high-stakes politics and clandestine crime were on an inevitable collision course. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, backed by the formidable might of the Justice Department, set his sights on dismantling the shadowy networks of influence that had long manipulated the corridors of power from behind the scenes. It was an era where the nation's highest office was determined to cleanse the body politic of its most deep-seated corruption. Amid this turmoil, figures like Frank Costello emerged as emblematic of the era's complex interplay between legitimate authority and organised malfeasance. Costello, dubbed the Prime Minister of the Underworld, lived with the opulence of a monarch, ensconced in the lavish environs of the Waldorf Towers. His lifestyle was a testament to the power he wielded, a power that extended far beyond the luxurious confines of his Manhattan stronghold. The Waldorf Towers was not just another luxury hotel. It was Frank Costello's sanctuary, a place where he ruled not from a throne, but from the polished anonymity of its lavish suites. Nestled on a quiet street, yet a stone's throw from the pulsing heart of Manhattan, it was here that Costello found a balance between opulence and discretion. His days began not with the clang of the city, but with the soothing rituals of a shave, a massage, and a manicure, a routine he indulged in daily amidst the soft murmur of friendly chatter. They give Costello a face smooth as a baby's cheek, Charlie Luciano confidently would remark, with a mix of bewilderment and admiration. How can anybody enjoy a manicure six days a week, along with all that pampering? Frank's off his rocker. I wouldn't let a barber anywhere near my face with a blade that close. After his morning indulgences, Costello would make his way to Peacock Alley. Just off the main lobby of the Waldorf, this space served as his unofficial office. Amidst the casual elegance of the bustling corridor, he conducted his affairs with a masterful blend of visibility and secrecy. It was here, over quiet lunches, that deals were made with politicians, strategies were whispered to business associates, and plans were crafted with the utmost discretion. Being at the towers just made sense, Costello would explain. It's part of the whole Waldorf setup, close but separate, elevated, away from the ordinary bustle. Meanwhile, in another part of the towers, under the guise of Mr. Charles Ross, Lucky Luciano orchestrated his own clandestine affairs. He had secured a suite, complete, with all the trappings of a well-appointed home, for an entire year, paying $800 up front. The suite boasted not just rooms for living and dining, but ensured privacy with a dedicated elevator and a private entrance on East 5th Street. Luciano's requirements for the suite were simple, yet firm. Everything had to be first class. However, even the best laid plans encounter disruptions. One day, a blunder by an overly curious associate threatened Luciano's low-profile existence. Mistakenly, the associate inquired about Charlie Lucky at the reception, stirring suspicions among the staff and guests. They started complaining about having a notorious gangster in their midst, Luciano recounted. But he was unfazed. The towers wasn't going to kick me out. I was too good a tenant. 
I didn't even haggle, just handed the clerk a couple of hundred dollar bills right then and there. From that point forward, he made sure to slip the clerk two hundred dollars monthly, securing his peace and the clerk's discretion. As time passed, Luciano settled into a rhythm dictated by the night. He rose late, and after breakfast, the day's visitors would trickle in, each arrival marking the beginning of another round of quiet negotiations and subtle power plays. Here, in the shadowed corners of the Waldorf Towers, empires were built in whispers, and fortunes were made with a handshake, all under the watchful eyes of the city that never sleeps. By this era, the nocturnal habits of the city's most notorious figures had crystallized into a ritual of luxury and late starts. Charlie, Maya, Frank, and Benjamin, titans of the underworld, had their days and nights inverted, their mornings starting only when most were contemplating lunch. Breakfast served as a prelude to the day's business, with visitors flowing in as if attending a never-ending soiree. Maya Lansky, known for his sharp mind and discreet manner, was a pivotal figure in these gatherings. His presence among the inner circle, which included luminaries like Adonis, Genovese, Costello, Torrio, and Lucchese, underscored the power dynamics of a post-Maranzano era. The bonds among them were not just visible, but flaunted, as each figure brought his own influence and expertise to the collective strategy table. Tony Bender, a character marked by his paranoia and penchant for secrecy, adopted a peculiar method of entry. He rode the elevator to the incorrect floor, then stealthily descended the stairs to Charlie's apartment, ensuring that his movements remained untracked and enigmatic. Such quirks contributed to the lore of their operations, blending caution with bravado. Zwilman was another regular whose entrepreneurial spirit dovetailed with the group's ventures. Together with Lansky, they expanded their empire into the lucrative niches of gambling paraphernalia transportation, slot machines, pinball services, and even specially rigged dice and craps tables, all flowing from their covert base in a nondescript Fort Lee warehouse. Their proficiency did not stop at logistics. They were also adept at the delicate art of debt collection from high-rolling clients who occasionally forgot their dues. Maya Lansky often took the lead in these delicate negotiations alongside Luciano, who stated, We sometimes had to remind people that they were behind in their payments, or that we didn't receive our cut from the tables we supplied them, he would explain with a calm, menacing precision. Longji was exceptionally skilled at persuading them to settle their accounts promptly. In this shadowy realm, where the nightlife was as much about pleasure as it was about power, these men navigated their empire with a blend of fear and favour, maintaining a delicate balance that kept them atop the underworld's volatile hierarchy. Maya Lansky was a master strategist, acutely aware that keeping Charlie Luciano close was beneficial. Reflecting on their partnership, Luciano once mused, but when you come down to it, I always thought I could trust Maya, even if he were different from me and most of the other guys. He liked to live in the background, in the shadows. In that way, as I looked back on it, he was one up on me. It was my publicity that really cost me the best ten years of my life. So, I guess in that way, Maya was smarter. Luciano later noted that the Trafficanti crime family mirrored Lansky's penchant for secrecy, operating discreetly to avoid public scrutiny. This covert approach helped them avoid the pitfalls that befell more conspicuous mobsters. Despite their cordial dealings, tension surfaced between Luciano and Vito Genovese, driven by Genovese's persistent push into the narcotics trade, an area burgeoning with potential yet fraught with risk. Genovese's obsession was not limited to narcotics. He was equally captivated by a woman named Anna, leading him to orchestrate the murder of her husband. He married her shortly afterward and flaunted his new bride on a honeymoon to Italy, which doubled as a business trip to cement his drug trafficking ambitions. While he was there, he made some good contacts. 
even though I warned him against making any connections with narcotics, guys, in Italy and France. Somehow or other, he must have had an idea for the future, and he planted a lot of particularly important seeds there, Luciano recalled. Upon his return, Genovese's ambitions were clear. Alarming fellow mobsters who feared the implications of his plans. Joe Bananas from Brooklyn and Steve Magadino, who ran things up around Buffalo, came to see me. They said Vito was talking to them private about setting up a line of junk right from Italy, through him, that he could put out all over the United States. They were afraid of this, and Magadino even told Vito to his face that he was going to convene the Unione Council and have him knocked off. It was talking to the wall. Except I did not know at the time that Vito was not listening and was going to keep on getting things set up, Luciano explained. Luciano's revelations about Genovese underscore the latter's eventual dominance in the narcotics market, a legacy initiated in the 1930s but fully realized in the 1950s and 60s. These ventures leveraged existing smuggling routes established during Prohibition, benefiting from the burgeoning aviation industry and the infrastructure developed for bootlegging. The prosperity of the era, combined with the post-war boom and the societal challenges of PTSD among returning soldiers, provided fertile ground for narcotics trafficking. Yet, Genovese's avarice often led him into precarious situations, such as his dealings with Ferdinand the Shadow Boccia, which ended in betrayal and murder. When Mike told me the story, I could not believe it. I thought the days when you could sell the Brooklyn Bridge to anybody were over. But would not you know that son of a bitch Vito was so damn greedy, he decided he was not going to give Boccia his fifty grand cut, Luciano recounted. As Genovese navigated his criminal empire through murder and manipulation, the larger political landscape was shifting. The impending end of Herbert Hoover's tenure and the rise of Franklin D. Roosevelt signalled a renewed crackdown on organised crime. Around Christmas of 1932, just before Hoover's term was over, Frank Costello and I got word that Dutch Schultz was going to be the next target for the federal tax guys after they got waxy Gordon, Luciano recalled, highlighting the relentless pursuit of mobsters during this transformative era in American history. Doc Stature made a desperate attempt to sway Dutch Schultz, pleading with him over the sound of gunfire that his paranoia was unhinging him. Schultz, wild-eyed and defiant, spun tales of betrayal, accusing Lucky Luciano, Maya Lansky, and all their associates of conspiring to usurp his fortune. Worse yet, he brazenly declared to Doc's face that if cornered, he would not hesitate to drag them all down with him, vowing to unleash a torrent of secrets that would land them behind bars. Stacker relayed these explosive revelations to Luciano, Lansky and the rest, who were left utterly dumbfounded. They could scarcely grasp the magnitude of Schultz's desperation or predict the havoc he might wreak if Thomas Dewey ever cornered him. They could only step back and watch the unfolding spectacle, holding their breath. During the height of the Prohibition era, Dutch Schultz, known for his frugality and understated style, had amassed significant wealth and political influence in the Bronx. He monopolized the beer and liquor distribution across New York and safeguarded the transportation of meat, extending his protection to wholesalers and restaurants. As the 1930s dawned, Schultz, with Charlie Luciano's nod, ventured into policy operations within diverse communities, including the black community. This expansion stirred conflicts with notable figures such as Wilfred Brunder, Big Joe Eisen, Henry Miro, and Alexander Pompez. Despite these hurdles, Schultz ascended to become a leading policy operator, amassing over $30,000 daily by skewing the odds to benefit the house significantly. Schultz was the stingiest man I knew, Luciano recalled, a touch of hyperbole in his tone. He hoarded millions yet dressed down extravagantly. He would boast about not spending more than $35 on a suit, always insisting on a spare pair of trousers. His highlight? 
buying a two-cent newspaper to see his name in print. Despite his quirks, when it mattered, Schultz was rock-solid, a dependable ally, not necessarily one you had to love. He even did me a solid by eliminating Vincent Mad Dog Cole, a hitman once considered for use against me. Schultz's elimination of Cole removed a significant threat to Luciano, but it also marked the beginning of Schultz's own troubles. The organized crime scene was evolving, learning from Al Capone's publicized downfall. Luciano and Johnny Torrio, recognizing the shifting sands, held clandestine discussions about the necessity of discretion in their financial dealings. We had to start straightening out our income tax filings, Luciano pointed out. Starting with 1928, I declared a growing income from gambling enterprises, styling myself as a professional gambler. But it was too late for Schultz. As Dutch Schultz faced the grim prospect of a 43-year sentence and hefty financial penalties, Luciano attempted to keep him calm. However, a formidable new adversary had emerged. Thomas E. Dewey a relentless prosecutor determined to challenge the mob's stronghold in New York. Dewey, building his reputation on successful convictions against notorious criminals for tax evasion, was zeroing in on Schultz, underscoring the unprecedented success of the US government in tax evasion cases. Despite the looming threat, Schultz did not buckle easily. He enjoyed a measure of police protection and had allies within Tammany Hall, including Jimmy Hines, involved in the numbers racket. Schultz continued his illicit operations unabated, maintaining his daily routines. Yet when Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia took office on January 1st, 1934, he launched an aggressive campaign against organized crime, enlisting the help of Treasurer Henry Morgenthau and the FBI, led by J. Edgar Hoover. The discussions were heating up, with Lepka hearing rumours that Dutch Schultz was going all out on Tom Dewey. He demanded a meeting with Luciano, Lansky, Costello and himself. Um, however, it was a tumultuous period, and many of these men had rackets to manage. Luciano was occupied, as was Lansky, leaving Costello and Lepka to face Dutch Schultz. In this critical meeting, Lepka warned Costello that Tom Dewey was not just targeting him, he was also gunning for Charlie Luciano. He revealed that right next to Dutch Schultz's name was Luciano's, and Dewey would not stop until he brought them all down. Costello took heed of this ominous warning. Lepka was astonished by how deftly Costello handled the situation, navigating the treacherous waters of organized crime with a calm and calculated demeanor. In the underworld's relentless game of cat and mouse, Costello's composure and strategy stood out, ensuring the syndicate could continue its operations despite the growing threat from Dewey's relentless crusade. The pressure intensified, prompting Schultz to seek deeper cover. Luciano, realizing the gravity of the situation, coordinated with Albert Anastasia in Brooklyn to secure a safe haven for Schultz. Meanwhile, Mayor LaGuardia turned his gaze towards Luciano, leading to a series of high-profile arrests within his circle. Recalling an encounter on the streets, Luciano narrated, I am walking down the street, and a cop stops me saying, Charlie, the commissioner wants to see you. It was New Year's Day, and I thought it was about a deal with the new mayor. But no, they just wanted to bring me in for appearances. Commissioner John O'Ryan met me and without much ado, offered to send me back home. It was a brief encounter, meant just for show. And it was not just me. Even Willie Moretti got the same treatment. They let him go, and later we all had a good laugh about it at the towers. It made La Guardia look tough in the papers. Charlie Luciano had a point. Many powerful politicians get elected and stage raised to look tough on crime. A prime example was during the 60s when Carlos Marcello was at war with the Justice Department. He knew he had to get the right people into positions of power, including the Attorney General's office. Marcello understood that these officials had to appear competent. Simply doing nothing would make them look ineffective. But if they took office and raided a few businesses, only to let them resurface later, 
or even targeted rival businesses, it would bolster their reputations. A notable case was Jim Garrison's election in New Orleans, a democratic stronghold where he had to appear tough on organized crime. Garrison targeted various prostitution rackets, brothels and hangouts controlled by organized crime. Yet Garrison infamously claimed that organized crime did not exist in New Orleans. His actions were partly targeting Marcello's businesses and mostly his rivals. Within months, these businesses were up and running again. The raids had no real impact on organized crime, but earned Garrison favorable articles in Life magazine and other outlets, which ironically would later criticize him in the broader war on organized crime during the late 60s, especially when he started investigating the Kennedy assassination. What Luciano faced in the 1930s was different. By targeting and arresting him, the authorities were sending a clear message. He was not untouchable and could be arrested and later charged like any other criminal. Luciano should have seen this as a warning. He should have battened down the hatches, retreated from the public eye, and set up a robust legal defence. He could have faked an illness to appear less in charge. However, he believed he was invincible and chose to ignore the signs. This hubris cost him dearly. Within three years, he was imprisoned for ten years and then exiled. Maya Lansky saw the entire operation shift before him. He knew that ordering the hit on Dutch Schultz alongside Luciano would make Luciano the next target. When Luciano agreed to exile in Italy, Lansky realized his friend's reign was over. Lansky began constructing a new legal protection zone in Louisiana. But it was Carlos Marcello's stronghold. Consequently, Lansky shifted his focus to Miami and Havana, Cuba, relocating more of his gambling operations there, and to the Bahamas, relying less on Charlie Luciano. As the landscape of organized crime evolved, Lansky adapted, ensuring that his operations remained resilient and beyond the immediate reach of American law enforcement. The underworld, ever shifting, demanded constant vigilance and adaptability. Traits that Lansky embodied as he navigated the perilous waters of the 20th century. In an unprecedented move, Mayor LaGuardia launched a relentless offensive against Charlie Luciano's vast criminal network, jeopardizing even his political alliances. Though Luciano's arrest might have seemed inconsequential, it was a clear declaration from city officials that even Luciano was not immune to their reach. This was merely the precursor to an intensifying storm. Among the mobsters, only a select few stood by Luciano, offering him a semblance of protection. Notably, figures like Dutch Schultz, who often attracted more scrutiny, were the first targets. If Schultz remained free, Luciano could too. However, the authorities, unyielding in their pursuit, focused on apprehending Schultz, planning to dismantle the rest of the organization once he was captured. At this point, Schultz was the most wanted man in New York, with Mayor LaGuardia vigorously continuing the chase. LaGuardia's dedication to eradicating organized crime was evident when he publicly destroyed hundreds of Frank Costello's slot machines, throwing them into the East River, an event widely covered by the media. This move was too late. The slot machines Costello had been operating were already in motion, spreading across state lines. These men had become masters of transportation. Any illicit goods legal in one state could be swiftly relocated to another where they were illegal, allowing them to dominate new markets. They moved gambling operations, slot machines, and their racing wire into Louisiana, gradually taking over the southern political corruption machine. This era saw figures like Huey Long rise to prominence. Known as a political boss with mafia ties, Long was bold enough to challenge Franklin D. Roosevelt, even penning books like 100 Days in the White House, What I Would Do. Long was fearless, leveraging popular tactics and policies to win public favor. His flamboyant and brash charisma intimidated even FDR. Long offered legal protection to Lansky and Costello, creating a sanctuary for their operations. However, for Luciano and Dutch Schultz, there was too much to heat on their operations 
and too late for them to flee. The landscape of organised crime was shifting, and despite their previous dominance, the relentless pressure from law enforcement and political changes caught up with them. Luciano, who once sat at the pinnacle of power, saw his empire crumble as he faced imprisonment and exile. Dutch Schultz, too, could not escape the tightening noose. Meanwhile, Lansky and Costello adeptly navigated these changes, ensuring their operations thrived under new protections. They expanded their reach into Louisiana, capitalizing on the region's political corruption. Arkansas Hot Springs, the Pendergast machine in Kansas City, Missouri, a mob haven, and various other political families became intertwined with organized crime, consolidating power and influence. Slowly but surely, these criminal masterminds began to control pathways to the White House. Kansas City's ties to organized crime and illicit gambling operations were so strong that they lasted well into the 70s and 80s. Members of the New Orleans crime families and the Chicago outfit, alongside various other families, used to gather at the back of restaurants or shops to receive skim money brought in from Las Vegas. The skimming of Las Vegas casinos was brought to light by Life magazine in 1967, but the FBI had been aware of its operation since the 50s and 60s. They knew that casino operations in Las Vegas were being skimmed to the tune of hundreds of millions, with the money being funneled into illegal activities such as narcotics, gambling and loan sharking. This was famously portrayed in the movie Casino, directed by Martin Scorsese. In Arkansas, only Madden was in control, and by 1936, Carlos Marcello and the New Orleans crime families had a stronghold over the state, extending their control into neighboring southern states. By the 50s, these men controlled most of the South and rapidly expanded into Texas. They were generating over $2 billion from Louisiana and over $700 million from Texas, possibly even close to $1 billion combined. In the 1940s and 50s, they were generating about $50 billion annually in profits. Luciano and Costello often stated that 80% of their profits were sent back into the hands of politicians, bent police officers, and crooked officials who facilitated their grip on organized crime. Arkansas would later become a sanctuary for Luciano when he sought protection from the hunt being perpetuated by Tom Dewey. The intricate web of corruption and influence stretched far and wide, illustrating the remarkable adaptability and resilience of organized crime. Lansky, always the strategist, saw the future and shifted his operations to Miami and Havana, ensuring the continued prosperity of his ventures. In the ever-evolving world of organized crime, those who could adapt and maneuver through the labyrinth of political and legal challenges emerged victorious. The saga of Luciano, Lansky, Costello and their contemporaries is a testament to the ruthless and cunning strategies employed to maintain power and evade the law, shaping the course of American history in ways both overt and hidden. Luciano had spent years cultivating influence over politicians, but he now faced an incorruptible adversary in La Guardia, whose actions were clearly aimed at currying favour with the city's elite, the very class Luciano had endeavoured to impress. I just could not understand that guy. What did he want? He was a wop like the rest of us, and he was not going no place, Luciano expressed in bafflement, struggling to grasp why La Guardia sharing his Italian heritage, would pursue such a vigorous campaign against him. Unbeknownst to him, President Roosevelt and others had grown concerned over Luciano's escalating political sway and were intent on curtailing it. Sensing the grim odds against Schultz, Luciano sought insights from Meyer Lansky, who confirmed the likelihood of Schultz's conviction. With the possibility of Schultz's imprisonment looming, Luciano's associates, including Genovese, Zwilman and Adonis, were already anticipating a reshuffling of his criminal empire. Faced with a difficult decision, Luciano pondered over the necessity of eliminating a loyal ally, Schultz, setting a precedent he was reluctant to establish. Amid mounting pressure from Mayo La Guardia, 
Luciano again turned to Lansky for advice, attempting to negotiate a deal that might spare him by sacrificing another prominent criminal, even hinting at his role in Waxy Gordon's arrest. However, when Dewey ambiguously responded, Luciano realized it was more a threat than an opportunity. Schultz, in a desperate bid for freedom, offered $100,000 to settle his case, but Dewey rejected this, stating firmly, we don't do business with criminals. Fearing a fate similar to John Dillinger's, Schultz eventually surrendered in Albany in November 1934, securing bail for the same amount. Seeking better odds, he pushed for his trial to be relocated to Syracuse, New York. During the trial in April 1935, Schultz's defense argued that he had not filed tax returns because his income was from now legal bootlegging and highlighted his willingness to settle his tax debts for $100,000. After two days, the jury was deadlocked, leading to a retrial in Malone. Prior to this, Schultz endeavored to ingratiate himself with the locals through generous acts. However, despite a repeated defense strategy, the jury acquitted him, leaving the judge and attorney Cummings decrying the verdict as a grave injustice. Luciano and his circle were stunned by Schultz's acquittal, having anticipated his criminal domain's redistribution. We were all sure that Dutch had to get it. We did not think there was any way he could beat a federal tax rap that was solid, they lamented. With Schultz's unexpected return to the underworld, tensions escalated. His extravagant spending during the trial raised concerns among his subordinates about the sustainability of their operations. In response, one of Schultz's lieutenants initiated talks with Luciano's group, signaling potential shifts in alliances. As Schultz reclaimed his freedom, those who had contemplated betraying him, like Abraham Bo Weinberg, were left fearing retribution. Bo went to see Longy Zwillman over in Jersey. They were in lots of deals together and asked him to help him out. Longy Zwillman listened to him and then brought Bo over to see me for a private meeting near Grant Tomb up on Riverside Drive, Luciano recounted. During this chilly meeting, Weinberg proposed handing over Schultz's entire empire to Luciano and Zwillman, hoping to preserve the operation and his 15% share. At the pivotal Waldorf Towers meeting, Luciano laid out Weinberg's proposal. I explained Weinberg's deal. I told them I felt like a grave robber in a way. Here we were, talking about cutting up Schultz, and he was not even in the can yet. Then we got down to cases. The responsibility for breaking up Schultz's had to be mine, because that is the way everybody wanted it, he deliberated. As the criminal landscape evolved, Luciano orchestrated the division of Schultz's empire. Policy rackets and gambling to Costello and Lansky, the liquor business to Adonis, and the restaurant rackets to Lepke and Lucchese. Over time, as leaders like Adonis and Lepke passed, their shares transitioned to Frank Costello and then to Vito Genovese when he took over the family. These unions, including operations like Seagram's, were controlled by figures such as Tony Provenzano and Russell Bufalino on behalf of Vito while he was in prison. When Vito Genovese died, his successors, Mike Miranda, Philip Lombardo, Fat Tony Salerno, Provenzano and others, saw their shares controlled by the Lucchese and Gambino families, consolidating power within these Italian-American crime syndicates. Jewish mobsters also faced significant changes. Many were eliminated, and behind the scenes, Maya Lansky facilitated the transition of their empires to Italian mobsters. For example, after Benjamin Siegel was killed, many of his operations were handed over to Italian mobsters. They maintained control and funded activities through the Teamsters Pension Fund. Another mobster, Longhi's Willman, was brutally murdered by the Gambino family, and his operations were taken over by Italian figures like Angelo Bruno, and mobsters like Boo Boo Hoff faced inevitable declines. Their empires were absorbed by Italian syndicates. By the 1960s, Italian mobsters dominated, 
while Jewish mobsters like Modalitz and Meyer Lansky took a back seat or retired. When Lansky was eventually betrayed, his entire racket, including his policy racket similar to Dutch Schultz's, was handed over to the Italian factions. These included Costello's family, which became the Genovese family, as well as the Lucchese, Gambino, Bonanno, and Profaci families. By the mid-1960s, the power in organized crime rested firmly with the three-headed dragon of the Lucchese, Gambino, and Genovese families, leading the criminal underworld. Charlie would continue. Then I turned to Meyer and Frank Costello, and I said, Vito goes in with you, and he gets 25%. You two guys split the balance. As for me, I get a piece off the top of everything. And if, by some miracle, he beat the rap, everything would go back to him. Everybody was happy. I did not make no enemies, and got mine. Despite the brief respite following his trial victory, Schultz could not shake off a nagging suspicion of betrayal. When he discovered Weinberg's potential double-cross, he reacted swiftly and violently, ensuring that no one would dare challenge his authority again. One of the boys in the stakeout seen him murder Weinberg and he told me about it. He said Dutch killed Bo with his bare hands. This fellow wanted me to know that Schultz had blood in his eye, but was too smart to show it to me. It was like a warning that Dutch might start his own war against all of us. It was a lucky thing that Dutch never got time to go work on us, because Tom Dewey had just been appointed special prosecutor in New York City, and he had the same blood in his eye about Dutchmen to put him away. Bo Weinberg and his brother George were in business with Dutch Schultz. Both brothers were extremely close with Meyer Lansky and knew all about Schultz's operations and activities. For Lansky, it was crucial, not just to eliminate enemies, but to have a swift way of transitioning their empire into his own hands. With men like the Weinberg brothers, Lansky had just that trusted allies who could help manage such transitions smoothly. However, Bo Weinberg had been eliminated, which infuriated Lansky. Despite this setback, George Weinberg was still alive, and Lansky could rely on him to continue their business dealings and maintain control over the acquired territories and operations. Despite Mayor LaGuardia's electoral triumph and his determined efforts to cleanse City Hall, the rot within the district attorney's office persisted. Charlie Luciano and his cohorts, including Jimmy Hines and the Tammany Hall political machine, continued to wield substantial influence over certain elections, pushing through corrupt officials to safeguard their interests. However, this era of unchecked corruption was drawing increased scrutiny. Pressure mounted on President Franklin D. Roosevelt to tackle the rampant illegal activities and bribery. In response, a special grand jury was convened by Dodge to delve into these allegations. Surprisingly, even after unearthing substantial evidence of corruption, Dodge inexplicably refrained from taking any legal action. This inaction led to significant frustration, prompting the grand jury to disband and issue a demand. Governor Herbert H. Lehman needed to appoint a special prosecutor to genuinely cleanse the city. After several prominent Republican lawyers declined the role, Thomas E. Dewey was approached and accepted the challenge. By 1935, Dewey had taken up the mantle, focusing his prosecutorial gaze squarely on Dutch Schultz, gradually amassing a trove of evidence to build a robust case against him for the murder of Jules Martin, one of his restaurant enforcers. Luciano learned of these developments on a snowy night in Albany in 1935. The situation was growing dire for Schultz, who now faced the potential of the electric chair. Luciano's concerns deepened, fearing the desperate measures Schultz might resort to. At this precarious juncture, Luciano knew Schultz's unstable position could lead him to implicate others if faced with a long prison term. Given LaGuardia's vigorous campaign against organized crime, Trust in Schultz and a few others was eroding fast. All of us were very worried. It seemed like Joe Adonis, Frank, Meyer, Torio, the whole bunch of us, spent more time having meetings than taking care of our business. 
and it was all about how to handle Dutch Schultz, Luciano recounted. The atmosphere was tense when Albert Anastasia brought alarming news to Luciano. Schultz had proposed a plan to stake out Dewey's apartment on Fifth Avenue, assessing the feasibility of assassinating the prosecutor. Anastasia came to me and said Dutch wanted him to stake Dewey's apartment up on Fifth Avenue. This was supposed to be a secret, but Albert never held nothing back from me. He said that Dutch wanted to find out how easy it would be to knock off Dewey, and he offered Albert the contract at any price. Luciano was acutely aware of the catastrophic implications of killing a public official. It could potentially dismantle everything he had built. He had always enforced a strict rule within his organization. We did not kill nobody but our own guys if they give us too much trouble, and we never made a hit without a unanimous vote of everybody on the council. If one guy said no, then it was off. Outsiders were strictly out of bounds. I set those rules, and nobody was going to break them. I just could not see how we would be able to buy our way out of trouble if we let Dewey get knocked off. Recognising the urgency, Luciano convened a secret meeting with the top leaders of the council, ensuring no word reached Schultz. I called a meeting of all the top guys of the council from everywhere. We took over the delicatessen early, and we talked it over for almost six hours. This had to be secret, and not a word of it could get back to Dutch. The council was at a critical juncture, reminiscent of the time they had to address Maranzano's fate. The council was either going to work, or the whole thing could fall apart at once. Everybody had a right to talk, and everybody wanted to talk. But the vote was strictly Sicilian. Lansky made that point noticeably clear, and according to the way I had expressed it out in Chicago more than three years before, I had only one vote, period. Lansky, acting as Luciano's Jewish conciliere, stressed that Schultz currently served as a protective shield for Luciano himself. The removal of Schultz would expose Luciano directly to La Guardia and law enforcement's onslaught. This realization chilled Luciano, highlighting the gravity of their decisions. Ultimately, the contract to eliminate Schultz was assigned to Charlie the Bug Workman, a renowned enforcer within the organization. In a saga that reads more like the plot of a gritty noir than historical recount. The leaders of the Lower East Side decided that the time had come to handle Dutch Schultz, the rogue elephant, as Stacher dubbed him. There was a warrant out for Schultz, but thanks to his connections, he had successfully evaded capture. Thomas Dewey, determined to bring him to justice, had spent a year in fruitless pursuit. This inaction forced the hands of the mob leaders. They signed Schultz's death warrant themselves. The original plan involved Albert Anastasia, known for his lethal efficiency, to handle the hit. However, given that Schultz had converted to Catholicism and his bodyguards were Jewish, the decision was made to keep this matter within the Jewish faction of the organization, respecting an unspoken agreement with their Italian partners, like Charlie Luciano, who understood the need to manage internal issues internally. In the intricate world of organized crime, Alliances were essential. Lucky Luciano, understanding the need for strong connections, aligned himself with figures like Vito Genovese. Luciano knew he needed Italian muscle to manage Italian affairs, ensuring that Italian gangsters understood it was not just the Jewish mobsters enforcing power. Killing Italians by non-Italians was frowned upon, and the sentiment was mutual. If a Jewish mobster needed to be killed, it was best left to Jewish associates, respecting the unspoken rules of ethnic divisions within the mob. However, as the structure of organized crime evolved, these boundaries began to blur. The Jewish criminal syndicate started to phase out, while the Italian mafia became more prominent. This shift led to a change in how killings were handled. Italian killers no longer hesitated to target Jewish gangsters, marking a significant shift in the underworld dynamics. Multiple high-profile murders exemplified this change. The deaths Bugsy, Siegel, Longhi, Zwilman, and Phil Castell were all carried out by Italian hitmen. 
These killings highlighted the new reality. The Italian Mafia had no qualms about eliminating anyone who stood in their way, regardless of ethnicity. In the 30s, however, Jewish gangsters still killed Jewish gangsters. Bugsy Siegel, ever the passionate figure, was initially eager to take on the task himself. Yet, complications arose. Among Schultz's protectors was Otto Abadaba Berman, a childhood friend of Bugsy, named after his favourite candy bar. The prospect of killing Abadaba shook Siegel, though he was prepared to proceed if necessary. Ultimately, it was decided to leave the execution to Charlie the Bug Workman, a foundational member of their organisation, known for his cold, ruthless nature when executing orders. Charlie the Bug Workman was a serious old-timer and a major player in the world of organised crime. He was a close friend of Red Levine, Charlie Luciano, Maya Lansky and many other gangsters. A Prohibition-era gangster, Workman was known for his reliability and was sometimes referred to as the powerhouse and Handsome Charlie. He played a significant role in the Jewish gangster network with connections across New York and other Jewish areas. Workman's loyalty and capability earned him immense respect. Even when prosecuted for the murder of Dutch Schultz, he never turned informer. His empire was well cared for during his incarceration, as he was never betrayed by Luciano, Lansky, or any other mobster. Luciano and Lansky, along with Red Levine, ensured that Workman's family was supported throughout his prison term. This level of respect and support showcased Workman standing in the mob. Known for handling even the most volatile individuals, Charlie the Bug. Workman was a highly respected and capable gangster, whose loyalty and effectiveness made him a crucial figure in the underworld. In 1964, Charlie the Bug Workman was released from prison, and remarkably his entire empire was still intact. This was a testament to the immense respect he commanded among the Mafia. Here is the article that was released upon his return to the outside world. In an era notorious for gangland rubouts, the gunning down of Dutch Schultz in 1935 stood out for its dramatic flair. Schultz, the infamous Bronx beer baron, was cornered in the washroom of Newark's Palace Chop House and cut down by a rapid-firing group of assassins along with his bodyguards Otto Biedermann, Lou Lulu Rosenkrantz, and Abraham Abbey the Killer Landau. Schultz, who was hit with a .45 caliber bullet, lingered for a day, rambling incoherently as police tried to question him. He referred to his killer in his dying ravings as the boss, the boy, and the big fellow. Five years later, Charles the Bug Workman was tried for Schultz's murder, based on the testimony of two alleged members of Murder, Inc. A plea of no defence during the trial led to Workman's life sentence. On Tuesday, after serving 23 years, the 54-year-old Workman, now a stocky, greying grandfather, was paroled from the New Jersey State Prison. During his incarceration, Workman sought to keep a low profile. He survived a near-fatal operation for gallstones, and subsequently built himself up by playing handball. For the last 12 years, he had been at the Rahway State Prison Farm, where he was given minimum security jobs and was considered a good prisoner. During a mass hunger strike at Rahway, Workman was one of 19 inmates who continued to attend meals, a decision that did not result in any retribution from other prisoners. Acting Prison Superintendent Stephen Fransack noted, Nobody is going to bother him here. It is just like the outside. The men look up to a man with his background. Workman's wife was a regular visitor, and his son and daughter-in-law also came to see him. After his release, Workman planned to visit his brother to acclimate himself to the outside world. Workman's return to society marked a significant transition from a past where many headline makers of his youth were no longer around. Dutch Schultz, whose real name was Arthur Flegenheimer, had founded a crime empire in the Bronx that thrived during Prohibition. Following the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, Schultz moved into the policy racket in Manhattan, sparking conflicts, notably with Vincent Mad Dog Cole, 
who was gunned down in a phone booth in 1934. Schultz faced mounting pressure from the federal government for tax evasion, and New York Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia barred him from the city. Ultimately, Schultz's demise was orchestrated by Murder, Inc. On October 23, 1935, Schultz and his bodyguards were killed at the Palace Chop House in Newark. Workmen came into the picture in 1940, when Brooklyn District Attorney William O'Dwyer, who later became Mayor of New York, was building a case against Murder Incorporated reputed head, Albert Anastasia. Two key witnesses, Abraham Kid Twist Reles and Albert Tannenbaum, testified that Workman admitted his involvement in Schultz's killing. Despite an alibi provided by a Brooklyn undertaker, who later recanted under pressure from O'Dwyer, Workman pleaded no defence. Throughout his life sentence, Workman offered advice to his younger brother Abe. Whatever you do, live honestly. If you make twenty cents, make it do you. Keep away from the gangs. Meanwhile, other notable figures met similar fates. Anastasia was killed in 1957 while reclining in a barber chair, and Louis Lepke Ukalter was executed in 1944. Kid Twist Reles, a key witness against Anastasia, died under mysterious circumstances, falling from a hotel window while under police guard in 1941. The Palace Chop House, where Schultz was murdered, has since been repurposed several times, most recently as a dry cleaning establishment. The memory of Schultz's dramatic end lingers, with visitors frequently asking to see the exact spot where the notorious gangster met his demise. The manager of the establishment remarked, A lot of them ask to go in the rear, so they can show me the exact place where Schultz got it. Every one of them points to a different spot. In the wake of the infamous killing of Salvatore Maranzano just a few years ago, America's underworld was once again abuzz with rumours and speculations. This time, the target was one of their own, Dutch Schultz. The story of his downfall has gripped mobsters from coast to coast. Here is an article that delves into the events surrounding his dramatic end. Dutch Schultz met his end last night. At 8.30pm, in a quiet, darkened room at Newark City Hospital, his infamous career of beer and bullets was cut short by gunfire. At 3.20am this morning, his loyal lieutenant, Bernard Lou Rosencrantz, also died. This marked a complete success for the extermination squad that gunned down Schultz and his three companions in a Newark tavern on Wednesday evening. Two men died within hours of the mass assassination, while Rosencrantz's death came unexpectedly. Doctors had initially believed he would last at least eight more hours, but he relapsed and passed away. Twenty minutes before Schultz succumbed to his injuries, his wife, Mrs. Frances Fliegenheimer, was arrested as a material witness. She was taken to police headquarters, where she revealed she was the mystery woman who had visited Schultz at the palace chop house an hour before he was shot. Upon learning of her husband's death, she broke down in tears. The plot that dismantled the Dutch Schultz mob has been traced to three possible groups. Police suspect the Big Six, a powerful combine aiming to control New York's $100 million a year racket business. The other suspects include the Shylock racketeers, previously led by the murdered Ambergs, and traitors within Schultz's own ranks, formerly led by the missing Bo Weinberg. Authorities believe the Big Six masterminded the purge. This group includes Charles Lucky Luciano, Charles Bugsy Siegel, Maya Lansky, Louis Lepke, Jacob Gura Shapiro, and Abe Longi Zwilman. Luciano's lieutenant, Zwilman, controls the Newark rackets. Prosecutor Thomas E. Dewey's investigators, who had been targeting Schultz for months, suspect the purge is linked to the lucrative Shylock racket. Dutch Schultz's empire had been crumbling as he evaded the law. His mob had started calling him the White Elephant. The Unione Sicilione took over his prime territories, leaving him with only parts of Manhattan and Brooklyn. His lieutenants, Marty Crompier and Beau Weinberg, managed what was left. 
Crompierre was loyal, but Weinberg was not. At the hospital, Schultz's wife, Mrs. Francis Flegenheimer, was grief-stricken upon learning of his death. There are suspicions that Schultz was shot with a poisoned bullet, which could explain why he did not survive longer. Dr. Harrison S. Martland, a noted crime authority, will perform the autopsy to investigate further. A few days before this article came out. On October 23, 1935, the plan was set into motion. Charlie Workman, alongside Mendy Weiss and another unidentified associate, entered the Palace Chop House and Tavern in Newark. With lethal precision, they gunned down Schultz's three bodyguards, Abe Landau, Bernard Lulu, Rosencrantz, and Otto Abadaba Berman. Schultz, caught unawares and isolated in the toilet, was swiftly dealt with. A single fatal shot by workmen ended his reign. Schultz's last moments were marked by the sacraments of his newfound faith, receiving Catholic last rites as he succumbed to his injuries. This execution effectively removed Schultz from Dewey's radar, without him ever betraying his associates. The aftermath saw Charlie Workman receiving a life sentence due to the widespread knowledge of his involvement, only to be released on parole in 1964. When Dutch Schultz was murdered, shockwaves rippled through the world of organised crime, capturing headlines and sending New York City into a state of intrigue and fear. The news articles of the time chronicled the brutal killing, delving into the details of who was murdered and the reasons behind the violent act. Schultz's death marked a significant moment in the city's history, shedding light on the dark underbelly of its criminal underworld and the ruthless power struggles that defined it. Meyer Lansky ensured that Dutch Schultz's entire operation was swiftly handed over to the Italian Mafia and other Jewish Mafia members like Lepke and Longis Wilman, as well as part of the earning being sent to Charlie the Bug Workman's family, giving Meyer Lansky effective control. Lansky meticulously managed the financial accounting of these enterprises, understanding which areas needed investment and which did not. He transformed Schultz's operations into a thriving multicultural criminal enterprise that started incorporating figures like Bumpy Johnson and black organized crime groups, particularly in Harlem, Brooklyn and other parts of New York. These black organized crime groups brought significant political influence on New York, helping control delegates and elections. Despite the low voter turnout among the black population at the time, those who did vote were often churchgoers, who organized crime groups began to sway through black gangsters. The operations in Harlem and other areas with strong black communities became crucial to American organized crime, especially in narcotics trafficking and gambling. In the 30s, 40s and 50s, black crime groups lacked the strength to challenge the Italians directly. However, by shifting away from gambling and towards narcotics in the 70s and 80s, black organized crime groups gained the upper hand. Initially, the Jewish mafia controlled the financial aspects of the policy and numbers of rackets, while the Italians handled operations and corruption. Black gangsters provided muscle on the ground. Frank Costello and Bumpy Johnson often dined together, highlighting their collaboration. Both Johnson and Lansky knew each other, and Costello, who was not racist, worked alongside black organized crime groups. However, black gangsters were never fully integrated into the upper echelons of the Italian mob, unlike their Jewish counterparts. In cities like Chicago, black organized crime groups collaborated with figures such as Paul Ricker. This collaboration across ethnic lines underscored the complex and interwoven nature of organized crime in America. Financial acumen, operational control and street-level enforcement came together to form powerful, far-reaching criminal networks. As the black crime groups grew stronger with the narcotics trade, they began to reshape the landscape of organized crime, even though in earlier decades the policy and numbers of rackets were predominantly controlled by Jewish and Italian mafias. In 1935, Charles Lucky Luciano realized he would soon face prosecutor Tom Dewey. 
Despite Luciano's confidence in his solid empire and attempts to distance himself from organized crime, Dewey was building a compelling case against him. By 1936, Dewey successfully prosecuted Luciano, leading to his imprisonment in 1936. This decisive action by the Lower East Side leaders not only neutralized a threat to their operations, but also shifted Dewey's focus towards Luciano, whose flamboyance and public notoriety made him an easier target. Despite his careful management of his image and operations, Luciano's fame was a double-edged sword. It made the public all too willing to believe the worst about him. Eunice Carter, an assistant to Dewey, cleverly exploited this vulnerability. She orchestrated a plan focusing on the prostitution rings controlled indirectly by Luciano's underlings, a sector of the criminal empire Luciano himself despised and remained ostensibly unaware of. Maya Lansky, Luciano's trusted ally, attested to their shared disdain for profiting from prostitution, reflecting on the impossibility of overseeing such a sprawling organization. How could the manager of a big corporation know what his employees are up to in their spare time? This narrative not only highlights the complex moral and ethical landscapes navigated by these historical figures, but also underscores the inevitable pitfalls of expansive power, where the left hand might well be unaware of what the right hand is doing, a theme as relevant in corporate boardrooms as it is in the annals of organized crime. Reflecting on these pivotal decisions years later, Luciano acknowledged the profound consequences. Sometimes I think okaying the killing of the Dutchman was one of the biggest mistakes I made. I did not have no choice the way he was heading. But look what happened. Once the Dutchman was dead, just like Lansky predicted, I was out in the open, as naked as a baby, and everybody who had been after Dutch came looking after me. With Schultz's demise and the end of Prohibition, Luciano's empire evolved significantly. He likened his sprawling criminal enterprise to a massive corporation, noting the impossibility of overseeing every operation personally. We were doing a business that was grossing a couple of billion dollars a year. I was like the head of that big company, not as boss of bosses, but as a guy a lot of people came to for advice, a guy everybody expected to be in on the big decisions. But there was no way I could know what was going on everywhere all the time. Charlie Luciano's reign, marked by strategic brilliance and brutal necessity, underscored the complex dynamics of power, loyalty and survival within the underworld a saga as compelling as any corporate titan's narrative, but played out on the shadowy stages of organized crime. Maya Lansky narrowly escaped a pivotal moment in his criminal career. In late 1931, he had arranged a significant meeting of his key associates at the Franconia Hotel, located on Manhattan's Upper West Side. However, a tip-off to the police led to a raid on the hotel. Fortunately for Lansky, he was not present at the meeting. Instead, Joseph Doc Stacher oversaw the gathering. During the police operation, Captain Michael McDermott and his team apprehended several notable figures. Although Lansky's absence was starkly evident in the official police photograph from the raid, those captured included notorious individuals such as Bugsy Siegel, Louis Lepke, Buchalter, Phil, The Stick, and Little Farvel, whose real name was Philip Kovalik. Among these, Little Farvel stood out for his unwavering loyalty to Lansky. Having known Lansky since their teenage years on the Lower East Side, Kovalik had been deeply involved in numerous altercations and was a prominent figure during a significant clash with Joe Masseria's formidable crew. The photograph also captured others from Lansky's inner circle, including Harry Big Greeny. Greenberg, Hyman Curly Holtz, Harry Teitelbaum, and Louis Shadows Kravitz. Despite the potential implications of such a high-profile raid and the subsequent police interrogations, all the men were eventually released without charges, a testament to their influence and perhaps the inefficacy of the legal pursuits against them at the time. This episode highlights not only the dangers and close calls Lansky and his associates faced 
but also their deep-rooted connections and the pivotal roles they played in the organized crime landscape of that era. Luciano also had experienced numerous brushes with the law, but none that had seriously threatened his freedom since Narcotics Charge in 1923. He had grown accustomed to the idea that the shadow of the penitentiary was not meant for him. Political manoeuvres and law enforcement crackdowns, like those on slot machines by La Guardia and Valentine, seemed merely to inconvenience him momentarily. Luciano and his associates simply relocated their operations to Louisiana, finding effortless ways around the obstacles. In the summer of June 1935, while gambling in Saratoga, Luciano mused over the apparent hypocrisy of the situation. Saratoga's gambling scene was bustling, with money openly changing hands, while just miles away in Albany, political figures loudly condemned the underworld's influence by day and participated in the very same gambling activities by night. It was a joke there, Luciano recalled. We were in Saratoga, the tables going full steam. The money was right out in the open, and nobody was doing anything to stop it. In the daytime, Governor Lehman's whole crime staff was screaming about gambling, the underworld, and how we all ought to be closed. But at night, those same crime busters were in Saratoga, gambling like everybody else. Despite his relaxed demeanour, the undercurrents were shifting. With Dutch Schultz now out of the picture, Meyer Lansky's warnings began to materialise. Luciano was becoming the primary target. Thomas Dewey, now singularly focused, was piecing together the complex web of Luciano's criminal activities. Assistant District Attorney Eunice Carter, while investigating prostitution cases, noticed patterns and similarities in the stories of many prostitutes and the lawyers representing them. This led her to suspect a broader conspiracy controlled by the syndicate. As the investigation deepened, prominent figures like Frank Hogan and Charles Grimes joined the legal offensive, probing deeper into the prostitution racket, hoping to flip some insiders into informants. By the end of January, enough evidence had been collected to strike. On February 1st, a coordinated raid on brothels led to multiple arrests, and those detained began to drop Luciano's name, hoping it might earn them leniency or immunity. Despite the tightening noose, Luciano remained outwardly unperturbed throughout 1936, maintaining his usual social circles and oblivious to the gathering storm. However, a tip from a friendly clerk at the Waldorf Towers, where Luciano was paying for information, alerted him to the arrival of federal agents. Deciding it was prudent to lay low, Luciano left New York abruptly. I figured it was an enjoyable time to take a vacation. Right then, I did not know what they were after me for, but I was not going to stay around and see. I just decided to go somewhere out of New York until things cooled down. I did not even pack my clothes. I do not remember taking anything with me, not even a toothbrush. I left with only the clothes I was wearing, went down the freight elevator, got in my car and took off. Luciano's journey took him first to Philadelphia, where he swapped his Cadillac for a less conspicuous vehicle, and refreshed his wardrobe. From there, he made his way to Cleveland, ditched the car, and boarded a train to Arkansas, seeking refuge in a gambling enclave run by Owen the Killer Madden. Meanwhile, back in New York, a grand jury was hard at work building a formidable case against him, leading to his indictment on 90 counts. The hunt for Luciano intensified, culminating in his accidental discovery in Hot Springs, Arkansas, by a journalist. Despite this, Luciano rebuffed the idea of surrendering. John Brennan was a nice fellow, but that was the craziest suggestion I ever heard in my life. I was having an enjoyable time in Hot Springs. Gay Orlova was with me, and the weather was nice. I was not about to take a train back to New York and fall into some kind of trap. However, his days of freedom were numbered. Under pressure from New York authorities, Arkansas law enforcement reluctantly moved against Luciano. Despite initial local resistance, the national scrutiny 
and the incessant pressure from New York prosecutors eventually compelled Arkansas officials to act. Luciano was arrested and held, marking the first stage of failure of his reign as a free man. New York officials, exasperated by Arkansas's initial leniency, pushed hard, spotlighting the state's awkward position as a haven for notorious criminals. In the grand narrative of organized crime during the early 20th century, Luciano's dramatic flight and eventual capture encapsulate the persistent tug of war between criminal enterprises and law enforcement, a saga defined by intrigue, corruption, and the inexorable pursuit of justice. While detained in Hot Springs, Arkansas, Charlie Luciano found himself caught in a precarious balance of favor and constraint. He recalled, The sheriff told me there was nothing he could do, that he had orders from the governor, and they had to hold me for a while. Anything I wanted while I was there, he would make sure I got it, and any time I wanted to use his office to make calls or meet people, it was okay. So, I took advantage of it. I even had Gay or Lova come in to keep me company. In his jail cell, Luciano plotted his next moves. His legal team worked tirelessly, crafting arguments to combat the extradition efforts. In a bold move, Luciano called a press conference, inviting journalists into his makeshift office. His face, lined with frustration and resolve, told of his fury. Back of this action is politics, the most vicious kind of politics. I may not be the most moral and upright man alive, but I have not at any time stooped to aiding prostitution. I have never been involved in anything so messy, he declared. The newspapers, however, distorted his words, adding to his aggravation. The fact is the newspapers and wire services did not print everything I said, especially how mad I was when it looked like Dewey's complaint against me had to do with whores, and I resented that not because I was looking for publicity, but because only Dewey's side of the story was getting into the papers. I did not like the idea of him starting any trial before he had me back in New York, Luciano expressed his displeasure over the media's portrayal. As the standoff between Luciano and the New York prosecutors dragged on, Hot Springs remained a stronghold of corruption and mob influence, a fact well known to the New York authorities. Attorney General Blakey, determined to uproot Luciano, ordered his transfer to Little Rock for extradition hearings. The local sheriff initially resisted, reluctant to hand over Hot Springs' infamous resident. However, when Blakey sent twenty Arkansas Rangers to enforce his command, the sheriff had no choice but to comply. Upon arriving in Little Rock, Luciano was heavily guarded, signalling the seriousness of his situation. If they were going to all this trouble just to get me back to New York, then I figured I'd be damned if I'd go, he defiantly stated. However, an attempt by one of Owen Madden's associates to bribe Blakey with $50,000 backfired spectacularly. At the extradition hearing, Blakey vehemently denounced the attempt, declaring, It must be demonstrated that the honor of Arkansas and her officials is not for sale, for blood, or money. Every time a major criminal from this country seeks asylum, they head for hot springs. We must show that Arkansas cannot be made an asylum for them. Luciano was stunned by Blakey's uncompromising stance. When I heard that come out of Blakey's mouth, I could not believe my ears. The truth of the matter is, Blakey was always working with us in Arkansas, and we never had a problem with him or his office before. All of us who were there thought he should have been able to handle the pressure from New York a lot better than that. At least, he could have shown some appreciation for all the things he got from us before. With any remaining hope of remaining in Arkansas dashed, Luciano was extradited to New York. Facing an overwhelming 1,950 years if convicted on all counts, and with bail set at an astonishing $350,000, Luciano had a brief moment with his lawyer, Mo Polakoff. Mo, this whole thing is crazy. You've got to get me out here. We got a lot of work to do on that son of a bitch Dewey. He's turning me into a whoremaster, Luciano lamented.
revealing his frustration and the perceived injustice. Polakov was equally infuriated, not just by the charges, but by Luciano's prior actions. But I could tell from the look on Polakov's face that he did not think it was all so crazy. He gave me hell, just like he'd done in Hot Springs when he got there for running out of New York without calling him first and getting his advice. He said that just because I took it on the lam, then fought like a bastard not to be extradited, it was going to be held against me in court. I said to him, Mo, which is all lawyer's horseshit. I could smell it out of hot springs that all Dewey wanted was to get my head in a noose, whether it was a frame or not. What did you expect me to do? Hand myself over on a silver platter? Back at his headquarters, Luciano was both mocked and supported by his circle, including Maya, Benjamin, Costello, Adonis, Tommy L., Albert Anastasia, Torrio, and his lawyers. The atmosphere was tense, but occasionally broke with humour. Everybody was kidding me about all of them whores I had been screwing. Albert gave me a whack on the back and said, Boy, Charlie, you must really be a lousy lady. Those broads all turned on you. Everybody started to laugh and Benny said, This should make a good title for a movie. Suck and tell. Everybody screamed. Then Polakov got up and his face was sour enough to turn into a lemon. The kidding around stopped suddenly, and Mo started to lay it on me. As Luciano faced the daunting prospect of significant jail time, his lawyer underscored the gravity of the situation. It was serious, and demanded a rigorous defence strategy. Aware of the immense resources needed, Luciano's lawyer gathered a formidable legal team. He brought on George Morton Levy renowned for his acumen in the courtroom, and Francis W. H. Adams, a former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York and future police commissioner known for his integrity and toughness. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily on Luciano and his associates as they sat in a somber silence, absorbing the implications of the legal battle ahead. It was Albert Anastasia, notorious for his direct and forceful approach, who broke the silence. Echoing a previously discarded idea from Dutch Schultz, Anastasia proposed a drastic measure, eliminating Tom Dewey, the zealous prosecutor leading the charge against Luciano. The Dutchman was right. We must knock off Dewey. It is the only thing to do. Charlie, I will do it myself to ensure there are no mistakes. And I will enjoy doing it, Anastasia declared with a chilling resolve. However, Luciano, recalling a pivotal decision made during a past meeting in Chicago, resisted. They had resolved then to avoid violent confrontations with law enforcement and the press to sidestep the massive backlash such actions would provoke. This ain't the way. We decided that a long time ago out in Chicago, remember? We decided we would not hit the newspaper guys or cops and DAs. We do not want the kind of trouble everybody would get hit if we hit Dewey. This ain't the way. At least not now, Luciano asserted firmly. Reluctantly, Anastasia conceded, and the rest of the group, though frustrated, agreed. They understood the risks were too great, and any violent action against Dewey would only exacerbate their problems. The consensus was clear their battle against the legal system would be fought in the courts, not on the streets. They would need to marshal all their legal and intellectual resources to confront what was shaping up to be Luciano's most challenging fight yet. At this moment, you must acknowledge Lansky's ability to juggle multiple challenges. Despite dealing with serious family issues at home, he was navigating the dangerous waters of organised crime. The murder of Dutch Schultz a man Lansky had once supported, highlighted the violence surrounding him. Many of his associates, including the notorious Luciano, were under fire, proving even the most influential mobsters were not invincible. As Lansky witnessed his Italian allies being targeted, he realised the harsh reality of their vulnerability. Amid these struggles, Lansky was not just surviving, he was prevailing. 
he was winning battles against both the government and rival gangsters, asserting his dominance within the Mafia and beyond. His focus then shifted internationally, setting up safe havens in places like Canada, the Bahamas, Brazil, and notably Cuba. This move was strategic, as Europe's growing instability and the rise of fascism made stable, non-warring countries attractive for his operations. Lansky's expansion was not just opportunistic. It was well-researched. Before making a move into Cuba, for example, he meticulously studied its history and dynamics. This careful planning was a testament to his approach. Lansky was not merely a mobster, but a shrewd businessman, turning his criminal syndicate into a global powerhouse. As he expanded his empire, Lansky's influence was felt worldwide, a stark contrast to the changing political landscape of his time. Thomas E. Dewey's campaign transcended the mere pursuit of criminals. It was an audacious challenge to the corrupt ecosystem nourishing the racket's existence. His call to the citizens of New York, urging them to bring forward evidence, was not just a request. It was a clarion call for collective action against the systemic corruption seeping into the city's very bones. The public's resounding response to Dewey's summons mirrored a society thoroughly exasperated with living under the shadow of organized crime's fear and extortion. They were more than ready to support his crusade to loosen the Mafia's stranglehold on their city. The demise of Dutch Schultz not only erased a notorious crime figure from New York's underworld, but also created a power vacuum, igniting a chain of conflicts and realignments among the city's shadowy echelons. For Dewey, Schultz's death was a stark reminder that his battle against organized crime was destined to be complex and fraught with danger. It demanded more than just legal shrewdness and strategic insight. It required a deep dive into the convoluted networks of loyalty and profit that stitched the criminal underworld together. As Dewey marched forward, targeting titans like Lucky Luciano, he wrestled not only with the monumental task of amassing enough evidence for convictions, but also with the palpable threats and resistance from a world where violence was just another currency. His relentless efforts laid the foundation for the legal onslaughts that would continue to challenge organized crime, underscoring the imperative for a sustained, vigorous effort to curb the mob's grip on American society. The arrest and subsequent trial of Lucky Luciano in 1936 became a landmark episode in the saga of organized crime in New York City, casting a spotlight on the deep entanglement of the criminal underworld with the city's political and social frameworks. Acting as a special prosecutor, Thomas E. Dewey pinpointed Luciano as a key figure in his broader campaign against the deeply entrenched rackets plaguing the city's economic and cultural life. The trial, revolving around charges of compulsory prostitution, leaned heavily on the testimonies of compromised witnesses and painted a vivid picture of Luciano's opulent lifestyle and his alleged efforts to streamline prostitution as a ruthless business venture. Meyer Lansky's reaction to Luciano's conviction, viewing it as a result of judicial manipulation and witness coercion, reflects the deep bonds of loyalty and shared enterprise within the criminal underworld. Lansky's caution and desire to avoid the kind of public exposure that had ensnared Luciano informed him of his subsequent decisions, driving him to seek safer havens for his activities outside of New York City. The rise of carpet joints across America during and after Prohibition symbolizes the magnetic allure of spaces that hover on the fringes of legality, merging dining, entertainment, and covert gambling operations. Situated strategically just beyond the reach of jurisdictions with stringent anti-gambling laws, these establishments flourished, fueled by the public's craving for realms where normal rules seemed momentarily suspended. The trek across the line to these venues transcended mere entertainment. It became a cultural phenomenon, illustrating the American populace's intricate dance with the law, personal liberty, and the pursuit of pleasure. In this shifting landscape, figures like Maya Lansky spotted golden opportunities to widen their criminal empires and capitalize on the thriving market of illegal gambling, 
wielding their networks and expertise honed during Prohibition. The narrative of these carpet joints, stretching from Ben Marden's Riviera in Fort Lee, New Jersey, to the buzzing scene in Saratoga Springs, New York, and beyond, captures a pivotal era in American history. It was a time when the lines between legality, morality, and entertainment were continuously redrawn. These venues also showcase the cunning adaptability of racketeers, who navigated evolving legal and social climates, discovering fresh territories and methods to sustain their illicit dealings. The saga of Julian Potatoes, Kaufman's migration to Florida, paralleling the state's fluctuating fortunes, embodies the perpetual quest for new bastions where the rackets could flourish, evading the escalating crackdowns in strongholds like New York. As America wrestled with the Great Depression's economic upheaval, the escapism offered by carpet joints, with their seductive promise of an alternate reality where fortunes could flip with a dice roll or roulette spin, resonated deeply. This epoch, marked by the ascendancy of figures like Lansky and the transformation of locales such as Florida into burgeoning havens for organized crime, set the stage for the forthcoming chapters in the saga of American organized crime and its intricate relationship with society. The establishment of Kaufman's gambling venture in Hallandale, Florida, during the mid-1930s, exemplifies the broader trend of criminal entrepreneurs exploiting the era's economic desperation and legal grey areas to forge profitable, albeit illicit, enterprises. Selecting Hallandale, a struggling agricultural community, as the site for Kaufman's Plantation Casino, underscores the opportunistic nature of these ventures, leveraging locales where economic fragility rendered local authorities and populations more receptive to the illicit gambling economy. This phenomenon was not isolated to Florida, but mirrored a pattern observable across America, where the boundaries of legality blurred in economically depressed areas. The collaboration between Kaufman and local figures like Frank Scheiman and Claude Litteral, and the success of their operation, especially the bingo games, drawing crowds from Miami Beach and beyond, underscores the significant demand for gambling and other entertainment forms during the Depression. This demand was driven by a mix of desperation, an inherent human penchant for risk-taking, and the allure of quick wealth amid tough economic times. Vincent Alo's involvement with Kaufman's venture, facilitated by his connections with Maya Lansky and the broader network of organized crime figures, illustrates the interconnectedness of the American underworld. The relationships formed on the streets of the Lower East Side and within prison systems had long-lasting implications, extending into sophisticated criminal enterprises that span the nation. Arlo and Lansky's mutual respect and shared business ethos represent a significant aspect of organized crime, alliances based on trust, shared backgrounds and complementary ambitions. Thus, the narrative of the plantation in Hallandale serves as a microcosm of the larger story of organized crime in America during the early 20th century, a tale of exploiting legal and economic vulnerabilities, sophisticated networking among criminals, and the transformation of small-time operations into significant business ventures. These developments occurred against a backdrop of societal struggles with the morality, legality and economic impact of gambling and other vices, which would continue to evolve in the decades that followed. Meanwhile, in the bustling heart of New York City, Luciano sat brooding over the impending trial. He passionately believed the case against him was as weak as tissue paper, impossible to hold up in the harsh winds of scrutiny. Regardless of what Polakoff said, I had a feeling that the Dewey case against me could not be built by prostitution, he mused. Everybody in New York, the police officers, the DA's office, even the politicians who weren't in our pocket, knew me well enough to know I could not be involved in nothing like that, not even indirectly. When Albert suggested taking out Dewey, Luciano had hesitated. His gut instinct told him Dewey had another angle. I did not know what it was and I was stupid, on account of I did not believe he could pull a prostitution frame and make it stick, he admitted. I must admit that all through the meeting Albert kept mumbling that I was wrong 
and warning me that I would be sorry. So chalk that up as the number one of all the mistakes I made in my whole lifetime. I should have let Albert take care of Dewey the way he wanted. Luciano's frustration with Dewey's actions had reached a boiling point. He saw Dewey as a corrupt politician who had overstepped by framing him, and this anger fueled his willingness to consider extreme measures. On the eve of the trial, Luciano met with his lawyer Levy, who delivered some crucial information. The prosecution's case would rely heavily on testimony from prostitutes claiming Luciano's involvement in their activities. Luciano felt a surge of optimism, convinced that no jury would seriously consider the claims of these women. He believed that once Adams and Levy cross-examined them, their testimony would collapse and the jury would dismiss the case. The trial began on a bright Wednesday morning, May 13, 1936, with Justice Philip J. McCook presiding. McCook was the embodiment of moral outrage, ready to react with shock and disgust during lurid testimonies. The jury comprised upright middle-class New Yorkers, carefully selected for this trial. Thomas E. Dewey, the special prosecutor, opened the proceedings with a dramatic gesture, pointing directly at Luciano and his co-defendants. He painted a vivid picture of how Luciano had orchestrated and controlled the prostitution industry in New York, driving out independent operators and placing Batillo in charge as his agent. Dewey described a sprawling racket with over 200 brothels, 3,000 prostitutes, and annual revenues exceeding $12 million. He highlighted the dire conditions of the prostitutes' lives, portraying them as victims trapped in a sordid existence under Luciano's control. One by one, Dewey called several prostitutes to the stand. Rose Cohen, Muriel Ryan, Dorothy Arnold, Betty Winters, Sally Osborne, and others. These women had never seen Luciano before. They testified about the houses, madams, and living conditions, but Luciano's name was conspicuously absent from their accounts. Luciano began to doubt his own presence at the trial. It was like I was someplace else. They were not talking about me, and I never ever seen none of them broads, he confided. I kept turning to Polakoff and saying, See, Mo, I told you they ain't got a thing on me. But Polakoff kept telling me, Wait, Charlie, he's just building this case. He must have a few surprises ready. Mo was right. The prosecution was methodically constructing a compelling narrative. They painted the prostitutes as victims of ruthless exploitation, women who had fallen on tough times and were trapped by men like Luciano. The jury and judge began to view the defence's objections with increasing scepticism. As the trial continued, the prosecution introduced more damning testimony. Al Weiner, one of Luciano's associates who had pleaded guilty, claimed that Betillo was running the business, seemingly absolving Luciano. But another co-defendant, David Marcus, alias David Miller, described his reluctant entry into the syndicate implicating Charlie, without directly naming Luciano. The most significant blow came from Peter Balitzer, alias Peter Harris, a former independent operator turned syndicate manager. He corroborated Luciano's involvement, claiming Batillo assured him that Charlie Lucky was behind it all. Despite being beaten as a warning, Balitzer's testimony stood strong. Luciano's frustration boiled over. When this guy Balitzer produced this cockeyed story, I grabbed Mo Polakoff's arm and I said, How can Dewey get away with this? For Christ's sake, Mo. Ain't that what they call hearsay? Ain't. Are you going to object? I knew Punk. I knew him from way back. And he was nothing but a cheap thief. A guy who was always trying to butter me up. If I wanted a sandwich, he was the first guy out the door on his way to the deli. But I could not figure out what he was doing at my trial. I heard he was up in Sing Sing for life. Luciano's outrage grew as Joe Bendix, serving a life sentence for multiple convictions, testified against him. Bendix claimed to have known Luciano since 1929, describing several conversations about the prostitution business. 
Luciano struggled to contain his emotions as Bendix's lies unfolded, his lawyer gripping his arm to prevent any outburst. But the most devastating blow came from a woman named Florence Brown on May 22nd. The door opened and we all turned around to look. This beat-up broad comes down the aisle to the stand. She looked like she had really been through the mill, like the gutter would have been a step up for her. Polikoff hits me in the arm hard and says, Who's she? I looked at her real close and I said to him, How should I know? I ain't never seen her before. Then Polikoff says to me, Hold on, Charlie. I have a feeling she is sad news. He did not say it strong enough, believe me. As Florence Brown took the stand, Luciano's fate hung in the balance. The courtroom held its breath waiting for the final act of a drama that would determine the future of one of New York's most notorious figures. Florence Brown, known in the underworld as Koki Flo Brown, entered the courtroom with an air of vulnerability. She had been in the grip of prostitution and drug addiction since her mid-teens, but thanks to Dewey's efforts and the Women's House of Detention, she had managed to claw her way out. Dressed modestly in a shabby blue dress, her age indeterminate, she stood before the court, embodying the innocence that had been so cruelly stripped from her. The atmosphere in the courtroom shifted immediately, sympathy flowing toward Florence as Dewey gently guided her testimony. She claimed to be Jimmy Federico's girlfriend and alleged that she had met Luciano. She painted a vivid picture of Luciano attending meetings with high-ranking figures in the prostitution ring, giving orders which Luciano vehemently denied. His lawyer, recognising the dangerous ground they were treading, advised him to remain silent. According to Koki Flo, she had heard Luciano express concern about Dewey's investigation during one of these meetings. She alleged that he had suggested temporarily shutting down their operations, but others, including Batillo, had disagreed. Luciano, she claimed, proposed organising the prostitution houses on a grand scale, akin to a chain store system, with madams on salary or commission. Even more damning, she testified that Luciano had sanctioned beatings, torture, threats and drugging to force women to work, giving permission to use strong-arm methods to bring madams and bookers into line. Dewey, confident in the impact of Koki Flo's testimony, felt he had struck a decisive blow. The jury and listeners were visibly shocked and horrified. Meanwhile, Luciano's defence faced a formidable challenge during cross-examination. They tried to undermine Koki Flo's credibility, but she remained steadfast, a story unwavering. Judge McCook, emotionally invested in the women's harrowing accounts, consistently ruled against the defence. Luciano's growing worry was palpable. I could see he was worried. They started to tell me that things did not look good. So I began to get worried too, even though I could not understand how anyone could believe Flo Brown's testimony. She sounded like Dewey rehearsed her for the leading part in Bertha, the Sewing Machine Girl. As the days passed, the prosecution's assault intensified. They brought forward Nancy Presser, a 26-year-old woman with a troubled past. She had entered the world of prostitution at 13, transitioning from a high-priced call girl to working in a $2 Harlem brothel under the control of James Russo, who received orders from Ralph Ligori. Nancy recounted her decline into drug addiction, from opium smoking to needle-based morphine use, all under Ralph's influence. Nancy's testimony was a further blow. She claimed that she had met Luciano at various locations and that he had never called her despite initially renewing their acquaintance. But during her darkest period, struggling with drug addiction, she received a call from Luciano, which left him stunned. I could not believe it when she started that story. It was like somebody hit me on the head with a baseball bat. Can you imagine me calling a beat-up broad like that who was working in a two-dollar cat house? but when I looked around I could see that the goddamn judge and jury really believed her. Nancy then alleged that Luciano had invited her to his apartment at the Waldorf Towers, detailing her visits with intricate descriptions of the suite's layout. 
She claimed that during her visits, she slept in his bed while he slept on the couch, asserting that Luciano was unable to engage in sexual intercourse with her because he could not get it up. She claimed this pattern continued during many of her visits. Luciano was beside himself with anger and disbelief. It was an ugly broad who had been throwing her fanny around 50,000 times with different guys, and she is laying like a queen while I am laying on the couch because I cannot get it up. I looked at Judge McCook when she was telling that, and that little prick was staring at this broad like she is the Queen of England, and I am worse than dirt. It was bad enough for me, that louse Dewey, to try to become a big shot off my back, railroading me in the worst way, but then right in the middle of it, to throw a zinger that Charlie Lucky Luciano cannot get a hard on. I started to get up from the defence table. All I knew was that I had to hit somebody, and at that minute I did not give a shit about who it was and what it cost me. Mo Polakoff, sensing the impending explosion, grabbed Luciano by the arm and ground his foot hard on Luciano's boot. Luciano yelped in pain. The courtroom's attention momentarily diverted. George Levy, furiously scribbling notes, whispered to Luciano, Take it easy, Charlie, this girl is helping us. Luciano could only pray that Levy knew what he was talking about. The trial continued to spiral downward for Luciano. Nancy's detailed descriptions of the Waldorf suite impressed the judge and jury. Despite Luciano's lawyer's best efforts to discredit her, the damage was done. Every detail she provided seemed to cement her story's authenticity in the minds of the judge and jury. Luciano's mind raced, his disbelief mingling with a growing dread. It was like I was in some nightmare, and I couldn't wake up, he thought. These people were believing every word these broads said, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. The prosecution's relentless assault on Luciano's character and operations was unyielding. Dewey, with his unwavering confidence, had woven a narrative that portrayed Luciano as the ruthless kingpin of a vast prostitution empire. The testimonies of Cokie Flo and Nancy Presser painted a damning picture that was difficult to refute. The trial dragged on, each witness further entangling Luciano in a web of guilt. Even as his defence team struggled valiantly, they were met with consistent opposition from Judge McCook, whose sympathies lay clearly with the prosecution. In the end, the cumulative effect of the testimonies and evidence proved too much. Luciano, despite his belief in his own innocence and the flimsiness of the charges, saw the writing on the wall. The tide had turned irrevocably against him. As the jury delivered their verdict, finding Luciano guilty on multiple counts, the reality of his situation settled over him like a suffocating blanket. His once unshakable confidence was replaced by a grim acceptance. I made a silent prayer that he knew what he was talking about, Luciano thought, reflecting on his lawyer's words. But deep down, he knew that no amount of legal manoeuvring could undo the damage done by the powerful, emotional testimonies that had swayed the hearts and minds of the jury. The courtroom, filled with the echoes of the final verdict, was a stark contrast to the bustling, vibrant city outside. Luciano, now a convicted man, faced the harsh reality of a future that seemed as bleak as the testimony that had sealed his fate. Nancy Presser's testimony continued with more damning allegations against Luciano. She claimed to have overheard him discussing critical issues related to the prostitution racket with Batillo and other involved parties. The take ain't so good. Looks like we will have to raise the two dollar houses to three and boost the five and ten bucks joint too, she alleged, he said. During cross-examination, Luciano's defence team challenged Nancy's credibility. They questioned her ability to describe the colours and details of the suite, where she claimed to have met Luciano, but she could not provide specifics. When asked if she had been shown pictures of the suite, she denied it. Nancy explained that she usually visited the Waldorf Towers at night, when fewer people were around, which allowed her to avoid security. To counter her claims, the defence called J. David Hardy, 
the assistant manager of the Waldorf Towers, who testified that the hotel had strict security measures requiring visitors to be checked in or announced. This contradicted Nancy's earlier testimony. Despite these efforts, the defence faced an uphill battle as the prosecution introduced more witnesses to bolster their case. The prosecution continued by summoning staff members from the Waldorf Towers and the Barbizon Hotel, aiming to demonstrate Luciano's prolonged involvement with other defendants, suggesting a well-organised prostitution racket. However, Frank Bryant, the assistant manager at the Barbizon, testified that he only knew Luciano and had never seen the other defendants, frustrating the prosecution's plans. Another blow to Luciano's defence came from Mildred Balitzer, wife of Peter Balitzer and partner in the prostitution houses. She testified that when the outfit began shaking down her husband's operation, she sought Luciano's help at a racetrack in Miami. Luciano allegedly told her he could not intervene, citing the nature of the racket. Luciano remembered the conversation, but disputed her account. Yeah, I remembered that, he said. I was only telling her I could not do anything for them, because I didn't have no part of it. How was I supposed to know what Batillo had been telling them? And then she got up there on the stand and made it sound like I was running the whole damn thing. All Dewey did was take the truth and just twist it around to make it come out looking like he wanted it to. Not like it really was. After three weeks of testimony and sixty witnesses, the prosecution rested its case on May 29, 1936. Outside the courtroom, Luciano appeared confident, telling reporters, I certainly expect to be acquitted. I do not know any of the people who took the stand and said they knew me, talked to me, or overheard me in conversations. I never met any of them. I never engaged in this racket at all. I had never in my life met any of the co-defendants but Bettilo before this trial. Despite his outward calm, Luciano and his lawyer Polakov were deeply concerned. Polakov discussed the possibility of an appeal, emphasizing that it would be costly and time-consuming. He insisted that if they could not win the case in court, they should do whatever was necessary to avoid conviction. Luciano's defense presented witnesses who were professional gamblers and bookmakers, testifying that Luciano's primary business was related to professional gambling. They highlighted his substantial gambling activities, including betting hundreds of dollars daily at the racetrack. Luciano believed they had exposed some of the prosecution's falsehoods. As the trial progressed, speculation grew about whether Luciano would take the stand. On the evening of June 2nd, with all witnesses having testified, the decision remained unresolved. We had a meeting that night and Polakoff and Levy started warning me not to go on the stand, Luciano recalled. I did not have to do it, they said, and it would not help because by that time the case was stacked against me. But I told both that I was going up there. I said it was crazy. Then broads were lying in their teeth and the only way to show it was for me to go up there and tell the truth. Levy and Polakoff, and especially Adams, warned me about Dewey. I told them I could handle that little prick. They told me I had not seen him really operate, that he was only waiting for a crack at me. I said I was sure I could manage myself. What a mistake that was. On the morning of June 3rd, Luciano took the stand. Under the gentle questioning of his lawyer, George Levy, his testimony was brief. Luciano denied knowing any of his co-defendants except for Bettillo and asserted that he did not know any of the prosecution witnesses, categorically denying all charges against him. He recounted his life story, including his transition from a student to running his gambling operation and becoming a leading racetrack handicapper. Luciano claimed he fought extradition from Hot Springs to give his lawyers time to prepare his defence. Levy asked Luciano if there was any truth to the charges against him. Luciano responded loudly and clearly. I never had anything to do with prostitution. I never got a single dollar from a prostitution racket. After Luciano's defence finished questioning him, 
they turned to the prosecution. Your witness, they said. Reflecting later, Luciano admitted, Sure, I lied up there on the stand. I lied when I said I never met some of the other guys who were on trial, or any of the girls that testified against me. What else could I do? I knew it was their word against mine, and if I ever admitted that I knew any of them, nobody would even hear anything else I said. The truth of the matter is, in those days, and even in all the years after, people come up to me all day long to ask for something, to get a handout, things like that. Sure, I would be standing in front of Ducor's drugstore, and a couple of them broads might come by and wave at me and say, Hello, Lucky, or Hi, Charlie, and I would wave back. I would not let none of them come within ten feet of me as far as going to bed was concerned. My girls came from Polly Adler, or they were girls I knew from shows or society, period. As Luciano finished his testimony, he glanced at Dewey, who rose from his chair with a predatory gleam in his eyes. Luciano felt a surge of fear. At that second, I was more scared than I ever had been in my whole life. I had a hunch that he was about to skin me alive. He walked over slowly, and he had a look on his face like I was a piece of raw meat, and he had been going hungry for a month. He kept coming at me, taking his time, and that is when I began to regret not listening to my lawyers about not taking the stand. But it was too late. The courtroom braced for Dewey's cross-examination, the air thick with anticipation. Luciano's fate hung precariously in the balance as Dewey approached, ready to dismantle his testimony piece by piece. In the hushed courtroom, the prosecutor began his cross-examination of Luciano with calculated precision. Are you known by other names, aside from Charles Luciano? Perhaps Lucky Luciano, Charles Ross, Charles Lane, and others. Luciano struggled to recall all the aliases he had used over the years. The prosecutor, seizing the moment, then shifted to Luciano's conviction for carrying a concealed weapon in Miami, Florida, within the last five or six years. Luciano admitted to the conviction but argued that there was no law against carrying a gun. The prosecutor presented a newspaper clipping with a headline suggesting Luciano carried a gun to go hunting in the Everglades. Luciano dismissed the accuracy of newspaper reports, eliciting a slight smile from the prosecutor before he quickly resumed his interrogation. The prosecutor delved into Luciano's life since the twenties, highlighting his involvement in bootlegging and professional gambling. He asked if Luciano had ever had any legitimate business during those years. Luciano mentioned owning a piece of a restaurant, only to backtrack when the prosecutor pointed out the insignificance of this single venture amidst his extensive criminal activities. Next, the prosecutor questioned Luciano about his marital status, prior arrests, and statements he might have made to arresting officers. Luciano admitted to being arrested and suggested he might have made various statements to the police, although he claimed not to remember the details. When asked if he had ever lied to the police, Luciano hesitated, leading the prosecutor to press him further, resulting in an admission that he had indeed lied to arresting officers. Luciano downplayed the significance of those lies. Turning to a traffic violation arrest in July 1928, when Luciano had been found with firearms and ammunition in his car, the prosecutor found Luciano's explanation implausible. Luciano insisted he had been hunting pheasants in July. Some guys and I had been invited up to Connecticut to what they called a shoot, and that is what the shotguns were for. They were not sawed off, they were regular ones for hunting and they cost over $300 a piece. The funny part of it was, when it comes to shooting them birds, I missed by a mile. What made the whole thing look so bad when it came out in court was that the police officers found two revolvers in the car. That was standard equipment in them days. I never went nowhere without some hardware. Things was very dangerous in 1928. The prosecution's line of questioning took a new turn as they delved into Luciano's past experiences. They began by asking how many times Luciano had been taken for a ride. Luciano responded with, just once. The spectators in the courtroom leaned forward in anticipation. The prosecutor continued, 
asking if Luciano remembered the details of the incident. Without waiting for a response, the prosecutor recounted the story of Luciano being found on Staten Island, savagely beaten and bound with tape over his eyes and mouth. Luciano tried to explain that he had given whatever information he had to the police at the time. The prosecution then revealed that Luciano had told the grand jury that he had been taken for a ride by men who demanded a $10,000 ransom, but released him when he promised to pay, even though he never actually paid it. Luciano denied telling that story to the grand jury. The prosecutor pointed out that Luciano had been arrested at the age of 18 for selling narcotics and had given federal agents information that led to the seizure of a trunk full of narcotics. Luciano admitted to this, but insisted that it did not make him a stool pigeon because he had been arrested himself. The prosecutor continued by questioning Luciano about his associations with notorious individuals, including Louis Buchalta, Lepke, Jacob Shapiro, Jake Gura Shapiro, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, Joe Masseria, Joe the Boss, Oni Madden, and Al Capone. Luciano answered each question with a yes or no, revealing his connections to these figures. The prosecutor then presented Luciano's telephone records from the Waldorf Towers and the Barbizon Plaza, showing repeated calls to an unlisted number in Terra Nova, Pelham, New York, and to Capone in Chicago. Luciano attempted to explain these calls as social interactions with friends and associates, but he could not fully account for the extensive call records. The prosecution's relentless questioning continued for four hours, intensifying the pressure on Luciano as they scrutinized his past and associations, exposing inconsistencies and contradictions in his testimony. I felt like I had been through a washings machine, and I really looked like it. I went to the washroom, and my shirt was all wrinkled and I was pressing from head to foot. That night, when I read The News and Mirror, they said it was a dreadful day for Charlie Lucky. Those writers did not have no idea how bad it really was. I never felt so tired, like I could sleep for a week. I could not wait to get out of the courthouse. I practically ran. After the gruelling cross-examination, Charlie retreated to his apartment. We all met at my apartment a little later, for dinner that I had sent up from Jack and Charlie's. I knew I was going to get convicted, that I did not have a chance. The only thing was, I figured Polakoff and Levy could work something out on an appeal, so that if I got a year or so, the appeal could wash it out, and I would not have to go to the can at all. It is a funny thing how when you hope for something extremely hard, you sort of talk yourself into believing it's going to happen. Then I looked at George Levy's face, and I got the same shivers that I had in court. Later that night, Luciano was alone with his mistress. Everybody left early, and Gay or Lova come up about eleven. She had been in the courtroom, and the minute she walked in she started to cry. Well, that did it. I figured if Gay or Lova already had me convicted, there was no point in hoping. During all the weeks of the trial she spent a lot of time with me. But we never did nothing, you know what I mean. I would get home too tired, too upset. Anyway, who could get in the mood? But that night, she made love to me. She was so kind and understanding, I almost asked her to marry me. Of course, the minute that idea occurred to me, I forgot it. How can you ask anybody to marry you if you do not know whether the next day you are going to be in jail? Anyway, that was the best night I ever had with a girl, and I will never forget it. As the trial drew to a close, Luciano faced his uncertain fate with a mixture of defiance and resignation, aware that the relentless pursuit of Thomas Dewey and the weight of the evidence against him had left him with little. When the court reconvened, Luciano's defence made its final desperate attempt to secure his freedom. Levy, one of Luciano's lawyers, began his closing statement with a carefully crafted argument. He refrained from directly accusing Tom Dewey of suborning perjury, instead suggesting that Dewey's assistants had assembled a group of actors who fabricated a drama Dewey believed to be true. Levy contended there was no substantial evidence on which Dewey could hope to convict Luciano. Rather,
Dewey was attempting to secure a conviction through prejudice, hysteria, and public preconceived notions. Levy methodically dissected the credibility of each witness, pointing out flaws in their statements and categorizing some as convicted felons and liars seeking lighter sentences. He emphasized the absurdity of certain stories and urged the jurors to critically examine the evidence. Concluding his statement, Levy expressed his belief that upon reviewing all the evidence, the jurors would return a verdict of not guilty. The defense team seemed confident that if the jury assessed the evidence objectively, they would not find Luciano guilty. The prosecution was then given the opportunity to present its final argument. Dewey emphasized that the credibility of a witness should not be undermined simply because they were prostitutes. He urged the jury to give equal weight to the testimony of such witnesses as they would to respectable individuals. Dewey denied making any deals with witnesses or madams for lighter sentences, stating they only called witnesses they believed would provide truthful testimony. He discussed the difficulty of persuading frightened witnesses to testify and assured them of their safety. Dewey underscored those witnesses like Koki Flo Brown and Mildred Balitzer had served the cause of justice. In his closing remarks, Dewey delivered a powerful and compelling speech, describing Luciano's actions as a shocking, disgusting display of sanctimonious perjury. He characterized Luciano not as a mere gambler or bookmaker, but as the greatest gangster in America. The impact of Dewey's final argument on the jury was palpable, and Luciano's situation appeared increasingly dire. I knew I was done for when that little son of a bitch finally sat down. I took one look at the jury, and there was no question about it. The twelve people looked like they all wanted to stand up and applaud. The final blow to Luciano's hopes came from Judge McCook himself. During his two-hour and forty-one minutes address to the jury, the judge made little effort to conceal his biases. He highlighted Luciano's multiple aliases as an indication of his lack of character and believability. McCook explained to the jury that they did not need to focus on the prosecution's inability to prove that Luciano directly received money or had direct contact with prostitutes. He emphasized that anyone involved in furthering a prostitution scheme, even indirectly, could be found guilty of unlawful acts. But the most devastating blow came when the judge stated, The crimes of which these men are accused are vicious and low, and those who would aid and abet such crimes are not to be met in polite society. This remark further solidified his stance against Luciano and the other defendants. On June 6, 1936, at 10.53 p.m., the jury retired to deliberate. Some jurors initially had doubts, leaning toward acquittal after listening to George Morton Levy's summation. However, these doubts were dispelled by Dewey's powerful rebuttal. After just ten minutes of deliberation, a vote was taken, resulting in an 11 to 1 majority in favour of conviction. A second vote was taken in the pre-dawn hours of Sunday, June 7th, with the verdict remaining the same. At 5.25 in the morning on June 7th, 1936, the courtroom was called to order. The judge ordered the defendants to rise, and the supervisor, Edwin Adderer, began reading the verdicts. The first name was Luciano's, and he heard the word guilty on all counts. Despite the turmoil inside him, Luciano maintained his composure, only revealing his distress internally. The rest of the defendants received guilty verdicts as well. Sentencing was set for June 18th, and the defendants were taken into custody for the first time. Eleven days later, on June 18, 1936, the defendants returned to court for sentencing. Justice McCook denied several defence motions to set aside verdicts, delay sentencing, or release the defendants on bond pending appeal. He announced that sentencing would proceed immediately, and the defendants would begin serving their sentences right away. Luciano's parole report, prepared by Irving W. Helpen, the chief probation officer of the Court of General Sessions, was based on information provided by Dewey's aide, Saul Gelb. 
The report described Luciano as a man who controlled various rackets in the city and lacked conscience, prioritizing money, luxury and indulgence over moral values. It highlighted Luciano's philosophy of not wanting to be a crumb, a term he used to describe those who saved and lived frugally, and his preference for a life of extravagance. The judge then began the sentencing process for each defendant. David Batillo received 25 to 40 years. Thomas Pinocchio received 25 years as a third offender. James Frederico received 25 years as a third offender. Abe Warman received 15 to 30 years. And Jesse Jacobs, Benny Spiller and Maya Berkman had their sentencing postponed in the hope that they would become informants in exchange for lighter sentences. Defendants who had pleaded guilty, such as Jack Ellenstein, received four to eighty-eight years, while Peter Balitzer and Al Weiner received two to four years, and David Marcus received three to six years. Finally, it was Luciano's turn. Judge McCook asked if Luciano wished to speak before sentencing. Luciano glanced at his lawyer and then addressed the judge, saying, Your Honour, I have nothing to say outside the fact that I need to say again. I am innocent. The judge was taken aback, hoping for some sign of remorse from Luciano. When none came, he believed every word of the evidence presented against him. The judge declared Luciano's total sentencing, a cumulative sentence of 35 to 50 years in state prison. It was the harshest sentence ever imposed for prostitution-related charges. They told me I would get a stiff sentence, but I did not think they would throw the book at me. I figured there was plenty of grounds for appeal, and that Polakoff would get me off soon. Still, it ain't easy to stand there and hear that. It was like getting a life sentence. Even with good behaviour, I would be an old man before I got out. Or I would be dead. The courtroom adjourned for the last time, and Luciano was led away without any ceremony, his hands in handcuffs, for the journey to Sing Sing Prison. The first stop on this journey was Danamora, located in the far reaches of upstate New York. It was here that Luciano would spend the next thirty to fifty years behind bars. After Luciano had been taken away, the prosecution team gathered on the courtroom steps and spoke to the reporters about their victory. They clarified that this trial was not solely about vice, but primarily a prosecution against organized crime. The control of all organized prostitution in New York was just one of the many rackets these convicted defendants were involved in. The prostitution racket was a means by which these men were convicted. The prosecution team further emphasized that certain high-ranking defendants in this case, along with other criminals associated with Luciano, had gradually taken control of various illegal activities, including narcotics, illegal gambling, loan sharking, the Italian lottery, receipt of stolen goods, and certain industrial rackets. These words would eventually reach Luciano in prison. Naturally, I read Dewey's whole statement. After sitting in court and listening to him myself, being plastered to the wall and tarred and feathered by a bunch of whores who sold themselves for a quarter, and hearing that no good McCook hand me a what added up to a life term, I still got madder at Dewey's crap than anything else. That little shit with the moustache comes right out in the open and admits he got me for everything else but what he charged me with. I knew he knew I did not have a faking thing to do with prostitution. Not with none of them broads. But Dewey was such a goddamn racketeer himself in a legal way that he crawled up my back with a frame and stabbed me. If he had hauled me into court to stand trial for anything I'd done, including conspiracy to commit murder, I would have taken it like a man but this was like a boil starting to grow inside me from the minute I heard what Dewey said outside the court. In some way, I was going to get even. In 1936, Luciano began his prison sentence the day after his conviction, as he went through the process of being processed as a long-term felon. Meanwhile, in New York Yankee Stadium, a crowd of 45,000 people, including many of Luciano's old friends, gathered to witness a highly anticipated heavyweight prize fight. The young and invincible Joe Lewis from Detroit was facing the former champion, Germany's Max Schmeling, 
in what was believed to be Louis's final hurdle on his way to the title. However, Joe Louis stumbled over that hurdle, and Schmeling seized the opportunity, knocking him out in the twelfth round. Luciano would reflect on this moment and come to realize just how much he truly valued his freedom. Room to Maneuver Luciano, a central figure in New York's organized crime scene during the 1920s and 1930s, was ultimately brought down by a determined legal effort led by Special Prosecutor Thomas Dewey. Luciano's trial in 1936 was a high-profile affair, with extensive security and numerous witnesses testifying against him. Despite some testimonies being discredited, Luciano was found guilty on multiple counts related to compulsory prostitution and was sentenced to 30 to 50 years in prison. Luciano's imprisonment marked a significant shift in his life, from being an influential mob boss to a prisoner strategizing for survival and influence, even behind bars. This period in his life is well illustrated by your quote, reflecting his internal conflict and the dramatic changes in his circumstances. The story of Luciano's rise and fall remains a compelling chapter in the history of organized crime in America. Luciano was in prison, and Lansky sat with his head in his hands, wondering what had happened to one of his main associates. This was a massive learning curve for organized crime. These men thought they were powerful enough to rig elections, shake hands with presidents, and get away with huge political corruption. However, Franklin D. Roosevelt manipulated, used, and discarded them. Roosevelt, an aristocrat, had no use for gangsters. His wealthy family had built America and controlled it. The Mafia was merely an extension of their influence, something to use and manipulate for their own purposes. When Roosevelt manipulated and used Luciano to win the White House, he intended to destroy organized crime. However, he inadvertently made them more powerful. By punishing Luciano and targeting the most famous mobsters, he left behind Mafia members who were extremely smart and operated in anonymity. It did not matter if Vito Genovese went to prison, his crime family remained one of the strongest, with multiple members still unknown. The same could be said for other crime families. The real powerhouses remained unknown while those who sought too much public attention or committed crimes too openly were the ones who were eventually reprimanded. Luciano made a huge mistake by being seen whining and dining with certain elites, pictured by newspapers. His meticulous movements were publicized, costing him dearly. It was easy to brand him a gangster because, during the years of prohibition, which is exactly how he portrayed himself, other mobsters began to realign their public image, ensuring they were seen as honorable, hard-working citizens who did good, including charity work. Lansky started to expand his operations beyond the reach of the American government, moving into the Bahamas, South America, and Cuba. This was a good strategy because intelligence agencies could now work with him. Whether it was Guatemala, Cuba, or Brazil, Lansky had operations there alongside various other criminal syndicates, and the Central Intelligence Agency wanted to use that. By the 1950s, Lansky, Carlos Marcello and other mob bosses were instrumental in getting Luciano out of prison. They turned and burned down a naval ship, shaking down the naval department, and the protection they offered to naval intelligence was in return for Luciano's release. This was orchestrated by Albert Anastasia, Frank Costello and Lansky. Lansky knew he had to form ties not with famous mobsters, but with equally powerful unknown ones, like Russell Bufalino. Around this time Bufalino and Lansky, along with other mobsters, moved heavily into Cuba. Bufalino, instructed by Lansky, dealt with the Italian syndicates already there. He was handling a lot of money coming out of Cuba, picking up hundreds of thousands of dollars and distributing them to various mob bosses throughout America. Bufalino was entrusted to take the majority of the casino profits from Havana and distribute them across the United States. Lansky was now building his own gambling empire, money laundering on a huge scale, 
and establishing a banking syndicate with accounts in Switzerland. He opened similar accounts for politicians, senators, judges, and other public officials, enabling their involvement in criminal activity. This type of corruption still exists today, marking the birth of bribery on a massive scale, to the point where they could influence and take over governments, including foreign ones like Great Britain. While Luciano was in prison, Great Britain declared war on the Nazi Empire, leading to a global shift. The British Empire and other European empires collapsed, marking the birth and rise of the American Empire as well as the rise of the Italian and Jewish Mafia.